Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. The Black Museum. Affiliated stations present Escape. All of fantasy. In a sanctum mystery. Lights out. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar and this is Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Here I have the privilege of bringing you some of the best dark, creepy, and macabre old-time radio shows ever created. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, sign up for my free newsletter, connect with me on social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit other podcasts that I produce. You can also visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Right this way, folks. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right up. Yes, welcome this night to a carnival. To the razzle-dazzle clash of color and sound. Hiding hate and evil and murder. Right this way. The freak show, ladies and gentlemen. See nature's mistakes. Step right up. It's opening night at Prince's Carnival outside St. Louis. But no fortune teller sees in cards or crystal ball the dark events that will happen here. I loathe everything you are. The sight of you sickens me. I'll... I'll... You're what? Beat me? Break me? Yes! Try it. Every man in the carny knows you're here, knows what you are. Giant... Strong man, grips, barkers, they're all standing by. If I call, they'll tear you apart. Oh, give me reason to call. I'd love it. Go on. Hit. Our suspense drama, Tattooed for Murder, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Nancy Moore and stars Terry Keene and Stefan Schnabel. It is sponsored in part by Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I promised you a carnival. I'll keep that promise. But be warned that I do not promise a spun sugar candy time. On the contrary. First, we must go back three years. That summer, St. Louis papers carried a story that was milked for all it was worth. It was worth a great deal. Headlines. Otto Kramer's daughter missing. Eris disappears. Erica Kramer not found. Foul play suspected. That was three years ago. Today, a mansion outside the city has a bronze plaque fixed to iron gates. Otto Kramer, no admittance. Due, perhaps, to the disappearance of a daughter of this house, no one is welcomed beyond its gates. 
Inside alone on this fateful morning, another daughter, Catherine, age 16, a few minutes ago said goodbye to her father as he left for his bank. She now starts upstairs to clean. In spite of his wealth, Kramer keeps no servants, obeying his own dictate, no admittance. Suddenly, Catherine is startled by a frightening sound. Only the doorbell. But no one comes here unless her father is present, and seldom then. Would Papa want her to answer? Catherine thinks not, is certain not. The ringing persists, but suddenly the sound no longer seems frightening. Instead, a merry summons the world at her door. She flies down the stairs, but as her hand touches, turns the doorknob, hope vanishes. No one has come to see her. No one ever will. Papa forbids it. Papa's word is law, is iron. Katrin? <gasps> oh, don't you know me, Kate? Erica! <gasps> Oh, little sister. I can't believe it. I thought you were... I thought you were dead. No, no, I'm real. I'm here. I'm back, and I'm certainly not dead. Oh, I've, I, I've, I've dreamed of this a thousand times. Oh, so have I, little Kate. Dreamed and planned. But come inside. Oh, hurry. I don't want to be seen. Does that mean you'll go away again? Oh, Erica, don't. Please don't. We'll talk about that in a minute. First, I... I have to look at this house, this, this prison I broke out of. Nothing's changed. Cold and ugly. No, I don't want to look at it. Let me look at my little Kate. Erica, where have you been? Oh, you are so pretty now. You're sweet, sweet 16. <laughs> doesn't matter about me. Tell me, tell me where you've been all these three years. You matter more than anything. Oh, does Papa ever let you out of this house? Well, sometimes he takes me driving, and sometimes to church. Papa, in church? Oh. And the rest of the time, what do you do? <laughs> Have you forgotten what it's like here? Oh, Kate, how could I? But then there were two of us. We could at least talk to each other. Who do you talk to now? No one. No tutor anymore? Not since I was 16. Not one single friend. No fun at all. Never mind. I know the answer. And Papa's made you into this... this pitiful little mouse. Oh, please don't talk about me anymore. Tell me where you went. <laughs> guess. Oh, but we did guess. Papa and I and the police. Oh, and the smartest private detective in all St. Louis. All that money squandered for nothing. Where were you? Why won't you tell me? All right, little one. Hang on tight. I was in the last place on earth Papa would dream a daughter of his could be. Where? In a carnival. <laughs> you, you, you're teasing. It's a joke. Oh, yes, a beautiful, wonderful joke. But the joke's on Papa. A Kramer daughter, part of a carny. Remember the summer I disappeared, the carnival two miles away? Uh -huh. Remember how we could hear the music sometimes? Oh, yes, I, I do remember. You, you said it was a merry-go-round. One afternoon, I sneaked off to see it. I couldn't tell you, honey. I was 19 and grown, but you were only 13. It would have scared you. Papa would know it. He would sense it, and he'd pry the story out of you. No. Yes, baby. All right. Well, maybe then. But not now. Not anymore. So, after I saw everything at the carny... Old as brass, I went to see the owner, Jody Prince. I told him about... about this concentration camp. I said I wanted to be in his carnival. He liked my looks. He said he could use me in one of his shows, and he'd sign me on. The next week, when Prince's carnival left St. Louis, I left with it. Out of this house of death. Into a carnival that was life. My sister? In a carnival? What do you do in a place like that? You'll know soon enough. Now, come on. Let's pack your bag. I'm taking you with me, and you'll never come back to this jail again. Taking me? Never come... Me? 
Why else would I be here, take this chance? Baby, did you think I'd forgotten you? But you never wrote. You, you never phoned. Katie, you must have known I didn't dare. Papa would have all mail forwarded to the bank, have the phone tapped, or what friends did we have to send a message by? I had to wait. Till the carney came back to St. Louis. But all these years I have planned for this day. The day Papa would lose you, too. So come on, let's pack your bag. I, I can't go. I can't do that. Kate, hey, please don't be afraid. You'll be as safe in the carney as I've been. He won't look for you there any more than he looked for me. Anyway, you, you will stay out of sight until we leave town. No, you don't understand. I have to take care of Papa. He's getting old. He has a very bad heart condition. Kate, you have given him 16 years of your life, and what has he given you? He's locked you in this prison, made you a servant, beat you. He hasn't beaten me once since you went away. I don't believe that. It's true, never. Well, then you never crossed him. I did. Mama did. And we both paid for it, Kate. Mama died of it. I ran away from it. And you're so beaten down, he doesn't even need to use that walking stick. Papa and I get along. Maybe not like other people, but we've made a life. The only life I know. <laughs> Why did you have to come and bring another? <laughs> Go away so I can forget you ever again. All right, all right, Katie. Please. Katie, please. Oh, this is too Go. sudden. This is too new. <laughs> Papa owns you. Owns every thought. You need time for thoughts of your own. Now, I'll go away. Until tomorrow. Today and tonight, think about the carney with me. I will go everywhere, see everything. It's like merry-go-round music, honey. Think of it like that. Uh, a merry-go-round? Mm -hmm. And you won't tell Papa I was here. Oh, oh no. Katie, promise. Nothing in the whole world could make me tell him. Tomorrow morning I'll come again. And by then you'll change your mind. Tomorrow my little sister and I will go back to the carney together. <laughs> Would, would you like some more meat? No. Um, wasn't the roast the way you like it? Papa? Will you have anything else at all? No. Nope. Um, then if it's all right with you, I'll, I'll, um, do the dishes. Excuse me. Stop her! Oh. Sit down. You have not my permission to leave. Yes, yes, sir. You will answer a question, Catherine, and you will answer with care. What is wrong with you tonight? Uh, no, nothing's wrong, Papa. Nothing is wrong. I see. Well, do you think perhaps you can fool your father? Well, yes, I, Catherine. Please, I'm not trying to fool you. There is a difference here. Something has happened. Now, you will inform me what it is. What, what could possibly happen? That is what I intend to learn. Did you leave this house? No, sir. Someone was here? No, sir. You lied. No, Papa, no, no. Then why did your hands tremble when you passed my food? Why is your face flushed like an apple? Huh? Why? I, it's just... Well, I, I just... I just don't feel very well. All day I... All day you hide something. Tonight you lie. I will have the truth, Katrine. One way or another, I will have it. I... I did tell you a lie, Papa. I went out. Ah. Out where, my child? To... To the grocery store. And how did you go to the grocery store? The, the bus. The bus. And what did you want at the store? I... Uh, to, buy, to buy apples. Ah. I do not see any apples. Oh, but they didn't have any. A pity. Since you so much wanted apples that you left the house, you are not allowed to leave. But we are very fond of apples. Are we not, Katrine? Yes, Papa. Why can't you look at me, Katrine? I... 
I, I am, Papa. Ah, uh, yes, now you are. Now, why do you stammer, huh, little one? Uh, your pleasant outing today has, has made you nervous, yes? Answer me! Papa! Answer, what ails you? I, I told you, I, I don't feel good. Oh, your health is poor. <laughs> I had forgotten. You will forgive me my lapse of memory. Oh, I'll go up and lie down if you don't need me anymore. No. No, no, I cannot spare you. There's something I want you to get for me. My walking stick. But it's there by your chair, Papa. Yes, yes, so it is, yes. But it is my whim that you hand it to me. All right, walk around the table. Pick it up. Place it in my hand. Come on! Good. I put great store by obedience. You know that, do you not, Katrine? Y yes, sir. Your, your, your stick, Papa. Uh, on second thought, you will hold it yourself. And we will observe it. The gold carving on the top. Describe it, please. It, it's a crown. A crown signifying authority. My walking stick once belonged to the Emperor Napoleon. His hand held it. Now you are soon mine. One more question, child. Why do I always carry it? I don't know. As the symbol of my authority... And when that authority is questioned, is in doubt, the walking stick of Napoleon removes that doubt. You follow me? Yes, sir. Alas, your sister's disobedience in the past compelled me to use it. But not on you, never. And I trust I never will. Shall we uh, test you? I, I, don't, I don't know what you mean, Papa. I think you do. Who was here today, my little Katrine? No one, Papa. No one was here, only me all day, except when I went for the apples. No one. All right. Hand me the stick. Thank you. A ah, fine instrument for changing lies to truth. Soon it will persuade you to talk and not about... <laughs> Who was here today? <laughs> now will you answer? Yes, yes, yes. Ah, splendid, splendid. Who was here with my little girl? Who? Erica. Erica. One hour later, Otto Kramer stalks down the thronging chaos of the Carnival Midway. Fury mounts to the bursting point as again and again he asks the same question. Where is Erica Kramer? And receives the same answer. Never heard of no Erica Kramer, mister. Carney personnel banded together to protect one of their own. Step right up, folks. Right this way. Right what way? Where in this pigsty is his daughter? We'll find out when I return shortly with Act Two. Otto Kramer glares with revulsion at the freak tent barker ballying the treasures within. See them all, folks. 25 cents. Only two bits. One quarter of a dollar. Kramer looks above the ballet stand at the garish canvases picturing the freaks. Larger than life. More terrible than life. His eyes rivet on the painting of a nearly naked woman. Her body ornamented with hearts, flags, stars, flowers, sunsets, peacocks, snakes. Then, lips locked white, he buys a ticket and enters the tent. On the fifth platform stands the tattooed princess, her body debauched by the colored needle, her beautiful face unmarred 
smiling at her admirers. Kramer halts by the first platform, stares, and when he has seen enough of his daughter's depravity, he turns and quits the tent. Erica. Princess. He's coming. I'm ready. Stay back of my wagon, Jody. Stay out of sight. I ought to be in here with you. Your father's got a heavy walking stick. Of course he has. He always has. Go on, Jody. I'm not afraid of him anymore. I can take care of Papa. All right. Call her if you need me, sweetheart. I will. Go on. Oh, hurry, Papa. Hurry, hurry, hurry. Show about to begin. Oh, and how I'll relish it. I let the midget tell you where my living wagon is. If I hadn't, no one in the carney would give me away. You think I didn't see you in the freak top? And the look on your face when you saw my body? Now it's covered with a cape. To spare you, Papa? Oh, no. <laughs> to play a game. And my game will outsmart yours, Papa. Hurry up. The stakes are high. Oh, hurry. Damn you. Greetings, Papa. Ah, a freak. My daughter, a freak. Would you care to come in? Or would a carnival living wagon contaminate the distinguished Otto Kramer? Ah, oh, I will come. The Princess Frederica is highly honored. Princess Frederica. Aren't you pleased I didn't use the name you gave me? I am revolted by everything you are. Oh, dear, I'm so sorry. And so sorry you beat poor little Kate till she told you where I was. That is a lie. Katrine tells me everything. She is my good, obedient daughter. Not like you. Katrine has no sister. Her sister is dead. Dead? Oh, no, old man. You're wrong. You who think you're never wrong. Katrine's sister is wonderfully alive. Making up for the years I might as well have been dead. Nineteen years you kept me buried alive. I came here to take you back where you belong. But you belong where you are. With the dregs of humanity. I wouldn't have this, this, this thing you are now. A freak flaunting the corruption of your body for anyone to see. Well, how well you put it. Would you care to have a private viewing? Oh, of course you would. Very well, Mr. Kramer. I remove my cape. Oh, freak. Tattooed freak. Can you think of a better way to disguise the scars my father put on my body? Oh. A snake, a rose, the stars and stripes cover stripes. You gave me. <laughs> oh, yes. I read the description you supplied the newspapers of your missing daughter. Scars on back from automobile accident. What accident? Oh, God, how I wanted to write to the editor. Dear sir, you cheat my distinguished father. You underrate his powers. The scars on Erica Kramer's back are from his loving hand. <sighs> Papa... Why can't you stop staring at me? Hearts and twine, garlands of flowers, cupids smirking. How strange you find them beautiful. No, they are loathsome. Vile! I'll, I'll... You'll what? Beat me? Break me? Yes! I wouldn't raise that walking stick if I were you. Everyone in the carney knows you're here, knows what you are, and they are standing by. If I call, they'll tear you apart. Go on. Hit. Give me reason to call. They'll come, every man on the lot. Big Lou, the giant, Herman, the strong man, the grips, the concessionaires, and the man I'm going to marry. What kind of man would marry a freak? Lie with a woman covered with cartoons? Only another freak. Jody Prince owns this carnival, and he's like his name. He's a prince. Now get the hell out of here before I have him throw you out. Oh, with pleasure I go. The sound and sight of you sickens me. You, you, you freak. My body's tattooed, but your soul is. You're the freak. And you stay away from my Katrine. That's one order I'll take from you, old man. This morning I thought my sister was worth saving. Well, she's not. She went crying to you about me. Kate's lost. She's all yours. Take her and welcome. Now get out. Ah, oh. 
You think that's all, Papa? <laughs> you think I'm through with you? That was only a teaser. The best is yet to come. Jody? Are you out there? Right here, honey. I just wanted the old man out of sight. If I met him face to face, I might kill him. Did you hear it all? Every word. Till you threw him out. I was right here by the door. Beautiful. Oh, it took me 22 years to win, but I have won, Jody. I have won. Yes. But there's something I don't understand. You said you were through with Kate. I lied. I had to. I had to make him think I wouldn't try to see her again. If he thought I'd be back, he'd have Kate guarded and I couldn't get to her tomorrow. Oh, baby, he's no dummy. He probably knows you lied and why. Anyhow, he won't take a chance. You'll be guarded, all right? Count on it. Then I'll get to her another way. How? I've got it all figured. I'm enough of my father's daughter, so nothing can stop me now. Good morning, Papa. Erica. Your secretary is taking her coffee break, so I just walked in. I hope you don't mind. How oh, dare you come here and shame me? Close that door. Out of respect for your lofty position in the bank, I wore a high neck and long sleeves. But I will shame you. Unless you give me Kate. Are you out of your wits? I tried to phone her. You've cut the wires. Ah, telephone is merely out of order. <laughs> Very unfortunate. I went to the house. You've hired a thug to keep me out. A friend, a house guest. A jailer guarding the gates. He will protect Katrine from undesirable associations. Or she suffered that indignity yesterday. It will not happen again. Unless you give me Kate, I will drag your name through the law courts. Indeed. All of St. Louis will know what you are. <laughs> you think I won't? I dare say your folly would go to that extreme, yes. <laughs> but what judge or jury would take the word of a cheap carnival tramp? Your word against Otto Kramer's? Who would believe a freak whose body is a monstrosity? Oh, they'll believe me when I show them what the pious Otto Kramer did to that body. Leave this office. Go where you belong. To freak tent. Okay, Princess, I case the joint. Can we do it? Risky, but we can pull it off. Now? In broad daylight? When you're afraid your old man will yank Kate out of town, or at least hide her somewhere. It's now or never. How do we do it? Well, if your house wasn't in the country, we couldn't. Sure, the place is locked and barred, but uh, what we do is get a rope ladder up to Katrine's window sill. What about the guard? How do we get through the gate? I'll take care of him. He's a cinch. He'll stay out of sight while I rap with our friend. I'll be a drunk looking for a shot of booze to cure a hangover. Oh, Jody. Listen, it'll be a great act. I'll be falling down drunk, see? I get close to the guy, he's off guard. Whammo, I knock him out. You go up the ladder and persuade Kate to come down it. Can I persuade her? Oh, sure you can. You hold all the cards, sweetheart. That plan you've worked out for her is a winner. Come on, let's go. me. He'll bring me back. He'll come all right, but not bring you back. I promise, honey. But how can you say that? You know he will. Because I've got a plan to stop him. Marvelous plan. I fooled him when I joined the carney, and I can again. No one can fool him. Last night when I tried to lie, he knew. He always knows. And last night, what did he do to you, Kate? I don't want to talk about it. Kate, we have to. Now listen to no, me. I can't. He has started can't. and he can't stop. The least thing you do to displease him, he'll use that stick. No. And nothing will please him except pain. Yours. Don't, don't. Please. That's what you'll say don't. to him. Don't, Papa, don't. And it won't do any good, Katie. Can't, can't you see you don't dare stay here anymore? I don't dare go. When you went to the carnival, he didn't know where you were. He couldn't bring you back. With me, he'll know. And he will bring me back. Little sister, he Please trust me. I tell you, my plan will work, but we need all day to get ready. Now stop crying. Listen to the plan. Ladies and gentlemen, introducing the star of Princess Carnival. Step right up to a platform, 
step lively. Feast your eyes. Every inch of her lovely body. A work of art. Blazoned with hearts and flags, flowers and cupids, snakes and peacocks, suns and stars. Frederica, the tattooed princess. Quiet up, quiet, please. Quiet up, quiet. Watch as the princess turns and the glory of Johnny, her Johnny, Johnny, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Who is this handsome gentleman who honors our little show tonight? Mr. Otto Kramer, isn't it? Why, ladies and gentlemen, I do believe the foremost banker of St. Louis is an admirer of the tattooed princess. <laughs> well, move along, all you lovely people. Come back to see me later. Right now, dear Mr. Kramer wants to talk privately to his princess. And bankers always get their money's worth. Oh, all right, of course, the tent, ladies and gentlemen. Keeney the Midget craves your company. All right, step lively. Right this way. Right this way. Good evening, Papa. How generous of you to patronize the freak show a second time. Where is Katrine? And how clever of you to know that she's with me. What have you done with her? I've taken her out of bondage. Answer me! I answered. I'll ruin you for this. I'll have this carnival blasted off the map. Just how do you propose to do that, Mr. Crane? Uh, now show me a carnival that isn't breaking the law. Underage performers, harboring criminals, white slavery, and now kidnapping. Katrine left of her own free will. She is 16 out of age. That is kidnapping. Oh, dear, dear. I never thought of that. So why haven't you called the police? What, and humiliate her? Make this vileness public? Now I call them after I take her away from here tonight. Now where is she? You think you can keep her from me? I've no intention of keeping her from you. You can see her at midnight, after the last show. I'll see her now. You'll see her when I say you can see her. Midnight. Four hours from now. Right here in this tent. Don't try to find her. She's hidden and protected. Until then, I recommend the House of Horrors. You'll feel right at home. Earlier this night, when Otto Kramer found his house empty, he stood murmuring Catherine's name over and over. Can it be that in his twisted way he does love this daughter? Nevertheless, his fingers tightened on the walking stick. When he left for the carnival, he did not trouble to lock the door. What was valuable in his house already had been stolen. No admittance. Anyone who disobeys Otto Kramer must be punished. We'll witness someone's punishment when I return shortly with Act Three. Night. The carnival toys are silent, closed down. The midway is emptying of customers, departing with bright balloons and cheap prizes won in games of chance. But one customer most surely does not depart, and another game of chance is about to begin. Otto Kramer paces the dimly lighted freak tent, a walking stick gripped in his hand. In Erica's living wagon, his two daughters are no less tense than their father. Both wear long satin capes winking with sequins. Erica's purple, Catherine's red. You two beautiful dolls ready? Oh, Jody, will it work? Easy, princess, easy. It'll work. It can't. Oh, I, I never should have come. Oh, now quit it, both of you. If Papa takes Kate back... It'll be worse than it was before. Will you cut it out? All those promises I made her, what was I thinking of? You know, I never saw you like this before. My girl has a nerve of ten people, ain't scared of nothing. That's when I take chances for myself. This is for Kate. Maybe I'll hurt her instead of help. And maybe you'll give her the world by the tail. Erica, 
Why didn't you ask the fortune teller if we should do this? Oh, for Pete's sake. Carlotta can't even predict that the sun will rise. And we can't predict Papa. Oh, I wish I hadn't come. Now, you won't say that when it's all over, honey. It's like spinning the wheel of fortune. Will it stop on Kate's number? The odds are terrible against her, Jody. I'll give you big odds. One gets you 20, the wheel spins her number. It won't. I know it won't. Oh, now, damn it. We spent all day getting ready for this caper. Here it is time for the big performance. You're both a mess. All right, you want to call it off? Let your old man win hands down? Is that what you want? No. No, never. Just the sound of the words makes me sick. Thank you for saying them. Put my head back together. All right, Kate. I promise you all over again, Papa won't want you anymore. He won't take you back. Now believe it. I will. I have to. Now, can we please just get it over with? That's more like it. All right, you're set, Kate. Remember everything you're supposed to do and say now. Every single thing we rehearsed. If I can just go through with it. My money's on you, kid. You're your sister's sister. Oh, I, I hope I can remember the part about the wings. I like that part. Let's just run over a couple of things. Princess, when you go into that tent alone, you keep the old man standing right by the entrance. Don't let him too near Kate, huh? I know, I know. If he moves toward her, step in between if you have to. I don't worry. Uh, Kate waits about two minutes. Then makes her entrance. Oh, it'll be the longest two minutes in the world. Well, that's why you wait till I say when. I don't want you jumping the gun. And remember, you're the one that stays close to the entrance. I will. And all the time, I'll be right outside. Ready or not, Papa, here we come. <laughs> Hurry, hurry, hurry. Show about to begin. Hey, hey, and what a show. So sorry I kept you waiting, Papa. Where is Katrine? She'll be along. Oh, what new trick is this now? Such a suspicious mind, Papa. Oh, you kept me here cooling my heels while you had a spirited away. But it will do you no good. You will be arrested for kidnapping and forced by the police to tell me where Catherine is. Simmer down, Papa. None of that will be necessary. Kate is just primping a little. She wants to be pretty for you. Hello, Papa. Ah, Catherine. You will come home with me this minute. And take off that cape. But such a pretty cape, Papa. Red satin and sequins. Oh, your sister's cheap finery. Kick it off at once. Dear Papa, you sound like a customer at a burlesque show. But I warn you, if Kate takes off the cape, you may not like what you see. She's wearing what I wear in my act. A G-string. Oh, Catherine, you would not. You don't believe it, Papa? No. Well, then I'll have to show you. I'll spread my cape like wings. Wings for flying. Free as a bird. And you can see if I'm as pretty as Erica. There. Look. Oh, my God. Take a good look, Papa. <laughs> Katrine. Yes. Not you. Yes, Katrine tattooed like me. Tattooed all. Oh, oh. No, no, no. Who tattooed, daughter? <laughs> what a proud father. Aren't the roses and sunsets pretty? <laughs> the flags and the hearts. <laughs> Down that cane. I'll break her in two for this. Oh, get, right, get out. Get out. Go to my wagon. I'll finish with Papa. Mm. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry you don't like it, Papa. Jody, go with Kate. Oh, you. Put down the cane. You won't break me in two either. Kate and I have broken you. Oh, Katrine. Katrine. Katrine tattooed. <laughs> Katrine as repulsive as you find me. Can you ever bear to look at her again? No, no. Since you don't want her anymore, then she can live with me. Oh. So that is your game. I see now. I see. Want her? No. So go home to your empty house and I wish you joy in it. I do not want her, but I will have her. What? I will have my daughter. You... You'll take her back the way she is now. I will take her. And the rest of her life, she will be locked away. She's a freak. And freaks should be hidden from the world. You can't. You can't. A freak. That is what you have made of your sister. Made ugly. What was beautiful. 
I hope that you are satisfied. That you are set. Papa! Uh, Papa! Papa! I'm not medicine. Medicine. Pocket. Your heart. Kate said you had a heart condition. Pocket. Pocket. Medicine. Medicine. Oh, it's a bad attack, isn't it, Papa? That's very bad. What a shame, because I didn't quite understand what you were saying before you fell down in the sawdust like that. I think you were saying you hope I'm satisfied? Please, please. Oh, Papa, Papa, I'm satisfied. I'm very satisfied. That medicine in your pocket... You have to take that to live, don't you? <laughs> Jody, stay outside. I'm coming out. You stay there. Oh, and Papa, you stay there. As if you could do anything else. I'll be back. Don't you worry. I'll be back. You all right, Princess? Oh, yes. Yes, Jody. Uh... You go back to Kate. You go back. What's the matter with you? Nothing's the matter. I'm saying goodbye to Papa, that's all. Go on, Jody. Katie needs you. I, I don't. I don't like the way you sound. You think this is easy? The hardest thing I ever did in my life, but I have to do it alone. Now, will you go? All right. All right, I'll go. Can I do it? Can I? Papa? Erica, med 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 medicine. Med medicine, med yes, I understand. You need it to live. Oh, yes, Papa, I understand that, too. But I... I don't know that, do I? Nobody ever told me. Oh, Papa, Papa, did you ever let Kate and me live? Did you ever give us what we needed? Now, hear this, Papa. If you still have time to wonder how I can do what I will do, I learned it from you, Papa. How could I possibly live with viciousness and evil and hate for 19 years and not have some of it come off on me? Medicine! Hurry! Oh, hurry, hurry, hurry. Yes, I'll hurry and tell Katie you're letting her stay. With your blessing. It is your blessing. Because you have to die so Kate can live. Goodbye, Papa. Goodbye, Papa. Erica. Erica. Katrina. Tell me again. Say it again. Papa doesn't want me. He doesn't want oh, you. Oh, he won't take me away. No, he won't take you away. Now or ever. <laughs> he doesn't want me all tattooed. He doesn't want you. And, and, and you're sure he's gone? Yes. He is gone. <laughs> Poor Papa. He didn't like my sunsets and flags and roses and hearts. Or truth or decency or kindness. Erica, what's the matter with you? You don't sound a bit happy. I am. I am, of course I am, little Kate. It's just that I don't like sunsets and flags and roses either. Not on you. Come on, let's wash all those pictures off. Oh, what if Papa had come close to me? What if he'd seen they were only painted on? How could he, Kate? All his life, Papa never saw anything. But evil and ugliness. Come on, Katie. Soap, water, a scrub brush. And my little sister is as good as new. By now you know it is not my custom to point a moral. But allow me just this once. Thank you. The moral is this. Erica spoke a profound truth. You cannot live with viciousness and evil and hate and not have some of it come off on you. I'll be back shortly.
my friends, you allowed me to draw a moral from our experience tonight. A rather depressing moral, I'm afraid. So let's look at the other side of the coin. The bright side. If you live with the good, the true, and the beautiful, some of that will come off on you, too. Our cast included Terry Keene, Stefan Schnabel, Rosemary Rice, and Ralph Bell. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Not there! For God's sake, Charles! Why not? That's the haunted villa. You? Superstitious? About that place. Anyway, it's boarded up. Has been for years. Uh, there's the house now. Maybe we can find some shelter. Oh! The statue, there is the house. The light can hit it. I can't look. It's as bright as molten steel. It's gone. Melted as it had never been. I could swear I saw that thing jump and run into the house. The whole villa is lighting up. Maybe it's on fire. And don't be silly. It's lamplight. Look, the door has opened. Welcome, strangers. Come, this is the night to be abroad. Welcome to the Villa de Espoir. The house of despair. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. This episode is dedicated to the men and women of our armed forces and first responders. Whether you are currently serving or have served in the past, you are appreciated. It is because of your courage and sacrifice that we enjoy the freedoms and liberties we hold dear. And I, for one, appreciate every single one of you for protecting what many of us take for granted. So thank you. Welcome to the Black Mass. The most haunting of our ghosts are often not those of the dead and departed, but those immortal ones that represent our own unlived life. It was this kind of spectre that Henry James struggled with in some of his later and more complex stories. Tonight, we bring you one of his last and most intriguing tales. Here is 
The Jolly Corner by Henry James. I know it's only a detail, Denver, but let's stick to the plan. No harm so far, but it's good we caught it in time. All right. We'll meet in the morning for another look. All right, then. Careful there, Alice. I'm sorry I had to stop, but you know you have to keep watch. I'm impressed. Impressed? The way you stood up. Think of it. All these years, you may have neglected your real gift. (laughs) Building skyscrapers? Yes. If you had stayed in America, you may have discovered your real genius. (laughs) Adding more awful architecture to all this... this bigness. Do you find it all really more awful now? Ah, they were ugly enough then, I remember. But with some charm. Now, proportions and values are upside down. The modern is monstrous. But you're here, and that's what you think of everything. (laughs) Everything. That's too much. I dodge the question. Everything has somehow been a surprise. But even so, my thoughts are almost altogether about something that concerns only myself. Your property? Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. I had to come back eventually to look after my property. This new monster is only a renovation. The apartment has flourished all along. I- I've managed to live for more than 30 years in Europe on the leases. My back turned. Now... Now I've had no trouble catching on. Climbing ladders, learning about materials, looking wise. It's actually been charming. Musing, catching on to it this way. Well, you're going to be well off for it, too. Astonishingly much, I should say. You can turn your back again. (laughs) Well, I don't know yet. You mean you'll live here, in one of your marble towers? (laughs) Oh, never. I have my other property, you know. Yes, the old place, you mean, on the corner. Mm -hmm. I wondered if you kept it. You kept it? Oh, yes, I've kept it. It's for that, I think, really, that I returned. I yielded to a humour I've had. It hasn't changed. Uh I've passed now and again. It's still as it was, except that it's empty. The corner has changed, I'm afraid. Ah, yes, the corner. The jolly corner. I called it that, and it was. I was very fond of it as a child. Happy years growing up there. Ah, Finally, after my brothers died, the property came wholly into my hands. Yes, I suppose it was to see my house on the jolly corner again, as much as anything that I came back. Are we walking there now? I was hoping you'd show me. Uh, Do you mind if we stop for a moment? Uh, Would you like to see it? Of course. Is it really empty all this while? Entirely. Except for Mrs. Muldoon, good woman who lives in the neighborhood, she comes by every day to open windows and dust and sweep. Oh, it must have been her I saw once when I passed. Uh, No doubt. Do you pass often? Oh, now and then. To get to the downtown Uh. You see? Empty. Empty. Vacancy reigns from top to bottom. Oh, who's there? Is it you, Mr. Bryden? Uh, yes, it's me, Mrs. Muldoon. I, I brought a visitor. Oh, you gave me a start, you did. Ma'am? Uh, this is Miss Staverton. Hello, Mrs. Muldoon. Uh, don't let us interrupt, Mrs. Muldoon. We're just going to look about. There's no trouble, Mr. Bryden. I know you usually come later in the day, uh, but let me push back some of the shutters and, uh, and let in some light. Oh, to show you, sir, how little there is to see, I'm afraid. The rooms are enormous. Uh, Too large, I'm afraid, for the times. For me. Unless you were a billionaire. Ah, yes. Had I but stayed at home and invented skyscrapers. The dining room is off there. Uh, But if you will, you can look down here later. It's my noonday round before leaving, and I can open up for you upstairs. Oh, don't bother about us, Mrs. Muldoon. We'll just walk about. Oh, no bother at all, Mr. Bryden. I'm only too glad to oblige. There's only one request I hope you never make of me, sir. Ah, well, and what's that? 
Oh, oh, well, if you should wish for any reason to come in after dark, I would just have to tell you, if you please, mm-hmm. that you must ask it to someone else. You mean there are things to see, then? It's what you might see, miss. And I put it to you that no lady could be expected to, like, scraping up to them top stories in the evil hours, could she? In evil hours? Oh, what with the gas and electricity off, they're evil enough. I've sometimes been late enough to need a taper, and it's been a gruesome march through all them grey rooms. I can imagine it, Mrs Muldoon. Mm. What do you imagine? Ghosts? <laughs> do you imagine my jolly corner is haunted? Well, there'd be nothing to fear. Eh? Maybe. But I'm not of a mind to find that out, Mr. Brighton. Now, I'll go ahead and open things and, and leave you to your own. Then I must go off if you'll not be needing anything. Uh, thanks, Mrs. Muldoon. I'll lock up when we leave. Oh, uh, ma'am. There used to be a fine view here of the river. There you can still see a slice of it between the buildings. Ten stories higher you'd have your view again. I suppose that's what they want. To pull this place to pieces and start up. Ah, it's exactly what they want. They're at me daily. They can for their lives understand a man's liability to decent feelings. There are, after all, other values. In short, you're to make so good a thing of your skyscraper that those ill-gotten gains will afford you to be sentimental here. (laughs) Well, yes, exactly. Uh, But is it sentimental? No, it's more. It searches me as I wander about. Oh, you prowl? Mere sight of the walls, shapes of the rooms, sound of the floors. This old silver-plated knob. I hold it and feel the slightest pressure of other palms. Dead ones now. Ah, Seventy years of the past. The ashes of my youth still afloat in the air. Well, I thought I had forgotten. But you can live here again if you decide to stay on. I might have lived here. I might have put in here all these years. Then everything would have been different enough. Ah, but that's another matter. And I can't now. And so the beauty of it, of my perversity, my refusal to tear it down, is the total absence of a reason. If there were reason, it would have to be a matter of dollars. So we'll have none. Not the ghost of one. Are you very sure that the ghost of one doesn't, sir? Oh, ghosts, ghosts. Of course the place must swarm with them. I should be ashamed of it if it didn't. Poor Mrs Muldoon's right, and it's why I haven't asked her to do more than look in. Well, if it were only furnished and lived in. Ah, for me it is lived in. For me it is furnished. Ah, yes. Well, this old elm lives on. What a charming garden. The memory is so alive. So alive. Mother. Father. My dear sister, that was her room up there with the balcony. I've seen her a thousand times sitting there, looking down, calling. Ah, my brothers. They're all gone, simply having run their course. Having met their end one way or another. And what would have become of you? Ah, Yes. All things come back to that. What might I have been? What course would I have run? An absurd, but I must admit, an intense speculation. A morbid obsession? What would it have made of me? What? I keep forever thinking about it. Idiotically, how could I possibly know? Well, you see what it has made of others. Uh, Something, something. Would it have made something of me? Well, you're something else. Oh, Alice. I'm nothing. Nothing. Nothing at all. You followed your own preference. That's something. Yes, Europe. Europe running off. I liked it. I loved it. If I'd only the least doubt, I would have stuck it out here. But I was too young, 27. That small, tight bud transplanted to a climate that blighted him once and for all. You wonder about the flower. So do I. I've been wondering these several weeks. I believe in the flower. It would have been quite splendid. Quite huge and monstrous. Ah, monstrous. Monstrous above all. 
and I imagine by the same stroke quite hideous and offensive. You don't believe that. Uh, if you did, you wouldn't wonder. You'd know, and that would be enough for you. What you feel, and what I feel for you, is that you, you'd you have had power. Uh, you'd have liked me that way. How should I not have liked you? I see. You'd have liked me, preferred me, a billionaire. How should I not have liked you? Well, I know at least what I am. I've not been edifying. I believe I'm thought in a hundred quarters to have been barely decent. I followed strange paths and worshipped strange gods. It must have come to you again and again. In fact, you've admitted as much, that I was leading all these thirty years a selfish, frivolous, scandalous life. <sighs> and you see what it has made of me. You see what it has made of me? Oh, you're a person whom nothing could have altered. You were born to be what you are, anywhere, anyway. You've the perfection nothing else could have blighted. If I hadn't left, don't you see how I'd never have waited till now? The great thing to see seems to me to be that it hasn't spoiled anything. It hasn't spoiled your being here at last. It hasn't spoiled this. It, it hasn't spoiled your speaking of... Ah, uh, do you believe then that I am as good as I might have been? Oh, no, far from it. But I don't care. You mean that I'm good enough? Will you believe it if I say so? I mean, will you let that settle the question for you? There's an idea. Some idea which, however absurd, I cannot yet bargain away. Oh, you see, you don't care either. But very differently. You don't care for anything but yourself. Exactly, exactly. But he isn't myself. He's the just so totally other person. But I do want to see him. And I can. And I shall. Yes. You shall. Well, in any case, I've seen him. You? I've seen him in a dream. Oh, a dream. But twice, I saw him as I see you now. You've dreamed the same dream? Twice over. The very same. <laughs> you dream about me at that rate? Ah, about him. Ah. Then you know all about him. Well, what's the wretch like? I'll tell you sometime. Some other time. It was after that visit with Alice that there was most of a virtue for me in surrender to my obsession. I sometimes came twice in the 24 hours. I projected myself all day, straight over the bristling line of hard, unconscious heads and into the other, the real, the waiting life. The moments I liked best were those of gathering dusk of the short autumn twilight. The time which again and again I found myself hoping most. Listening. Feeling my attention, never before so fine, on the pulse of the great, vague place. I always caught the effect of the steel point of my stick on the old marble of the hall pavement, on the black and white squares, where I played once, long ago. A dim reverberating tinkle from the depths of the house, of the past of that mystical other world that might have flourished for me had I not abandoned it. 
I'd put my stick noiselessly away in a corner. Then feel the place in the lightness of some great glass bowl, all precious concave crystal set delicately humming by the play of a moist finger round its edge. The concave crystal held this mystical other world, and the murmur of its rim was the sigh there. The scarce, audible, pathetic wail of all the baffled, forsworn possibilities. What I did was to wake them. They were shy, all but unappeasably shy, but they weren't really sinister. At least, not before they had taken the form I so yearned to make them take. The form I hunted, hunted. Hunted from room to room, story to story. Long after midnight, with my glimmering light, moving it slowly, holding it high. And he, oh, he would roam restlessly too. When I stopped, I could hear him. He was cautious. Shifty, his evasion laying on me finally a rigor to which nothing in my life has been comparable. No pleasure as fine as this tension. No sport demanding the patience and nerve of this stalking a creature more subtle, more formidable than any beast of the forest. I'd place my light on some mantel shelf and step back into a shelter or shade as if a rock or tree, holding my breath, living in the joy of the instant. With habit and repetition, I gained to an extraordinary degree the power to penetrate the distances, the darkness of corners, to resolve back into their innocence, the treacheries of uncertain light, the evil-looking forms taken in the gloom by mere shadows, by accidents of the air, by shifting effects of perspective. And putting down my light, I could still wander on without it, pass into other rooms, see my way, visually project a comparative clearness. It made me feel this acquired faculty like some monstrous stealthy cat. I wondered if I would have glared at these moments with large shining yellow eyes and what it would be for my poor heart-pressed alter ego to be confronted with such a creature. Apparitions. Oh, apparitions. People have been in terror of apparitions, but who had ever before so turned the tables and become himself in the apparitional world an incalculable terror? I like the open shutters. I opened everywhere those Mrs. Muldoon had closed, closing them as carefully afterward. I liked, and above all in the upper rooms, the sense of the hard silver of the autumn stars through the window panes, the flare of the street lamps below. <laughs> that was human, actual, social. The world I had lived in. That light supported me mostly in the rooms to the front and the prolonged side, though it failed me in the central shades and the part at the back. There the house was the very jungle of my prey. The place was more subdivided there. Small rooms for servants had been multiplied. Nooks and corners abounded, and there was a, a back staircase over which I leaned many a time to look far down. My whole perception was open to cultivation, bringing it to perfection by practice, grown already so fine that I could hear, hear. Well, there was something, something unmistakable, 
I felt it as I walked. I was being kept in sight, tracked at a distance, so that I should appear less arrogantly to myself merely to pursue. I'd make abrupt turns, wheel about, stop, seek it out. I had kept vistas clear, doors open, so that in the darkness my imagination might almost achieve it, project it, project into it. A refinement, a beauty. I had known fifty times the start of perception that had afterwards dropped, had fifty times gasped, there, 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 under some fond, brief hallucination. But he'd retreat, retreat. Though he retreated more reluctantly as time went on. Then, finally, one night, at the top among the more intricate rooms, he was there. He was there waiting, not falling back. Waiting at the far end of a series of rooms I had just passed through. Waiting, worked up finally to anger, ready to fight. Thus we stood. Ah, both terror and, and what? Rejoicing. Terror, but also relief that in that other form I could inspire such... Such fear. Thus we were one and the same. The door between the rooms was open, and from a second another opened to a third, but there the chain ended. The third door, which had only moments before been indubitably open, had subsequently been closed. I stood before it. The question of danger loomed and with it as never before the question of courage, for what I knew the blank face of the door to say was, show us how much you have. Show us how much you have. It stared, glared back at me with that challenge, and he, he behind it, shut up, defiant, turning the situation. Oh, discretion. <laughs> discretion. It could take its time. But at the threshold, this hunger so close to being met, it was amazing, but also exquisite and rare, that insistence should have quite dropped from me. Discretion. Discretion. Could it save the situation? I wouldn't touch the door. I wouldn't touch it. I'd only wait a little to show, to prove that I wouldn't. I listened. As if there was something to hear. And this attitude between us, while it lasted, was its own communication. If you won't, then good I spare you. I give up. We both should have suffered. I retire, never to try again. So rest forever. Rest and let me... I turned away. I turned away. I turned away and retraced my steps. And finally, at the other side of the house, I did what I had never done at these hours. I opened half a casement and let in the air of the night. Spell was now broken. And it didn't matter. <sighs> the empty street. <laughs> its other life, so marked even by the great lamplit vacancy, was within call, within touch. High above I watched, as for some comforting common fact, some vulgar human note, a scavenger, a thief, some night bird I would have blessed, positively welcomed that sign of life. But nothing. Oh, nothing. The <laughs> discretion even there. Oh, not the 
the least stir of the great grim hush. The life of the town was itself discreet, under a spell. Great, builded voids. Had they ever spoken so little to any need of the spirit? Great, crowded stillnesses with its sinister mask. Oh, it was this large collective negation that proved to me at last what a night I had made of it. I thought, of course, of retracing my steps. There was, after all, the whole rest of the house to traverse for me to leave safely. Safely. <laughs> Unless the door had meanwhile opened and he was once more at large and in possession. But if I saw the door open, if I saw it, it would send me straight to this window and make my way uncontrollably, insanely, fatally to the street. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't look. That hideous chance I avert only by recoiling in time from assurance. Ah, assurance. Ah, assurance, assurance. I have the whole house now to deal with. My instinct is all for mildness, but I ran, ran through the rooms, the passages, to... To finally the top of the stairs. Mildness. Mildness, yes, I, I take it all with no rush. No rush, but quite steadily. Steadily. The house seems immense. The scale of space inordinate. They might come in now, the builders, the destroyers, they might come as soon as they want. Do you hear all your rooms, all your steps and flights? The wreckers will have you. The wreckers will have you a splintered pile. I descended as if to the bottom of the sea. The last flight to the lower hall. Oh. Oh, there, the marble floor, the squares black and white of my childhood. Only to cross these once more to the door to safety. To safety. <sighs> the vestibule gaped wide. The inner door had been thrown far back. That one I had closed. <sighs> oh, at last, he, he, to me, to touch, to know... The penumbra, dense and dark, was the virtual screen of a figure which stood in it as still as some image erect in a niche, or as some black visored sentinel guarding a treasure. A treasure! My liberation! Oh, my supreme defeat! Grey, glimmering margin. The central vagueness diminishing, taking form, taking form. It was somebody! Somebody, something. What made the face dim was a pair of raised hands that covered it, buried it. The head was bent. The figure wore evening dress of gleaming silk lappet and white linen, pearl buttons, gold watch guard, polished shoes, a pair of thick eyeglasses hung from a string. My revulsion had become immense. He hides his face from seeing. Standing there for the achieved, the enjoyed, the triumphant life, yet he can't bear to be faced. Wasn't the proof in the covering hands? The hands. So spread that I could see that one of the hands had lost two fingers. They were reduced to stumps as if accidentally shot away. But even so, the face was guarded, guarded and saved. Coward, coward, show yourself, show yourself. Ah. No, no, it isn't mine, it isn't me. It is hideous, monstrous. It fits me at no point. Imposter, 
imposter! The face is that of a stranger. It approaches, comes upon me nearer. He is evil, odious, blatant, and vulgar. He advances as for aggression, and I, I, sick with the force of his shock, fall back under this life larger than my own, this rage of personality under which my own collapses, turns to darkness, gives away, is gone, 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 gone. Mr. Brighton. Mr. Brighton. Oh, ma'am. He's coming round, I think. Mr. Brighton, sir. You gave uh, us a scare, you did. Mrs. Muldoon, he'll be all right. Uh, would you fix something? Oh, oh yes, ma'am. I, I go to my place for some tea now or broth. Some broth would be better now. I only be a few moments uh, now. Mrs. Muldoon, don't bother. She's gone. She'll be right back. Alice. Don't move. Lie here a moment. We found you here in front of the vestibule. You had fallen. Oh, where was I? We thought you were dead. <laughs> it must have been that I was. Oh, yes, I can only have died. You, you brought me to life. How? And now I shall keep you. Oh, keep me. Keep me. Keep me, Alice. But how did you know to find me? I, I was uneasy. You were to have come. Do you remember? And you sent no word. Oh, yes, I remember. I was still out there in my strange darkness. Where was it? What was it? I must have stayed there so long. So you knew of this, of what has happened? I've known that you've been coming here. Known? Well, I believed it after our talk here. <laughs> that I'd persist. That, that you'd see him. Ah, but I didn't. There's somebody, some beast that I brought to bay, but it is not me. No, thank heaven, it's not you. Of course, it wasn't to have been. But it was, it was that. I was to have known myself. I, too, saw you. Saw me? Saw him. It, it might have been at the same moment. In my dream again, he came back to me. I knew it for a sign that he had come to you. He didn't come to me. You came to yourself. Now, yes, I've come to myself thanks to you. But this brute, this brute with his awful face, a black stranger, he's none of me, even as I might have been. Isn't the whole point that you'd have been different? Uh, as different as that. Haven't you wanted to know exactly how different? But anyway, you appeared to me... Like him? Yes, a black stranger. <laughs> and how did you know it was I? He told me you had seen him. You liked him. You liked him, that horror. I could have. He was no horror. I had accepted him. Accepted? I didn't disown him. I knew him. You, my dear, so cruelly didn't. You saw only his difference. Well, he was less dreadful to me. It may have pleased him that I pitied him. Pitied? He, he's been unhappy, ravaged. And haven't I been unhappy? Am I not ravaged? Ah, I, I don't say I like him better. But he's grim. He's worn. <laughs> Things have happened to him. His glasses... I recognized the kind for his poor ruined sight and his poor right hand. And he has a million a year. He has a million a year. But he hasn't you. And he isn't you. He isn't you. Mr. Bryden. Oh, sir, you're all right again, I see. Now, shall I bring the tea to you here, or can you come outside? We'll go outside, Mrs. Muldoon. We're all right now. Go ahead, Mrs. Muldoon. We'll follow. No, he isn't you. He isn't.
That was The Jolly Corner by Henry James. The technical production for tonight's broadcast was by John Whiting. The music was specially composed for this program by Peter Winkler and performed by bassoonist Bill Kaufman. The part of Alice Staverton was played by Pat Franklin. The part of Spencer Bryden and the adaptation for radio were by your host of the Black Mass, Eric Bowersfeld. And now, good night. Or someone you know is struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction, please visit the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. There, I've gathered numerous resources to find hope and solutions. For those suffering from thoughts of suicide or self-harm, there is the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline as well as the Crisis Text Line. Both have trained counselors at all hours to help those in need, and the page even includes text numbers for those in the U.S., Canada, United Kingdom, and Ireland. Those struggling with depression can get help through the Seven Cups website and app, and there's information for anyone to read more about what depression truly is and how to identify it through our friends at ifred.org. There are resources for those who battle addictions, be it drugs, alcohol, or self-destructive behavior, along with help for those related to addicts. The page has links to help you find a therapist or counselor, to find help for those who have a family member with Alzheimer's or dementia, help for those in a crisis pregnancy, and more. These resources are always there when you or someone you love needs them on the Hope in the Darkness page at WeirdDarkness.com. Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13, Box 13. Holiday, why did you ever leave a soft job as a reporter to become a freelance writer? Or why did you ever advertise for adventure? Oh, I know it makes you feel like a kid with a box of Cracker Jack. Now you can't stop. You might run across a juicy peanut, or that grand prize is supposed to come in each and every package. But you know by now that storylines, like money, don't grow on trees. Susie, where have you been? You know where I've been, Mr. Holliday. Down at the Star Times after the mail. Oh, yes, the, the mail. What's in box 13? <laughs> Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. Box 13. I wish I'd never rented the thing. Wish I'd never even thought of it. Mr. Holliday, you're early this morning. Well, I had to see if my new secretary's on the ball. <laughs> you know, since you rescued me from that nut factory down at the Star Times, I'd work my fingers off the elbows for you. Uh-oh, now take it easy, Susie. You'll need those elbows to lean on when things get dull around here. Dull? Oh, things don't get dull around you, Mr. Holliday. Hey, what's that you're writing, a love letter? Yeah, it's a love letter to your publisher. Uh-oh. He wants to know where are the chapters you promised for the new book. 
And what are you telling him, Susie? <laughs> a lie. A big fat one. <laughs> Thanks. By the way, where are those chapters, Mr. Holliday? If I had them, my secretary would have lots of extra work. You don't like extra work, do you, Susie? I don't like your worried look. When you don't have chapters, you have that look. Oh, uh, does it show so much? Like a chinchilla coat in a dime store. <laughs> it's the hallmark of my profession, Susie. Say, what was in box 13 today? Mm, some goof wants you should fly to Mars with him in his homemade rocket. Oh, brother. Oh, yes. There was a ticket to a radio broadcast. Radio broadcast? Silky Soap presents Time for Drama, starring Gene Blake, 8 p.m. Federal Broadcasting Studios. Now, who would want me to go to a radio show? The advertising agency, maybe? Huh. Those guys don't read Adventure Wanted ads. Too busy dreaming up singing commercials. Someone wants you should go to that broadcast awful bad. Yeah. She wrote please in the back of the little envelope. She? Yeah, she. And I don't like her taste in lipstick. The one she wrote this with is the color of blood. And now you have returned, my darling. I am alive again. The wind is down, but still the seas run high. Time for Drama has presented The Wind is Down, starring Jean Blake. In the cast were Robert Baylor as John, Agnes Sloan as grandmother, and Marvin Masterson as the butler. This is FBC, the federal broadcasting company. Sorry, sir, we're closing the studio. Huh? Oh, sure, sure, I... I was meeting someone. They, they must have stood me up. Uh, someone in the cast, sir? Yes, it could be. Uh, I think they've all gone, but you might try the stage entrance. Oh, thanks. How do I get there? Uh, around the back of the building, sir. Just opposite the parking lot. <laughs> you blithering idiot. Watch where you're going. Sorry I didn't see you coming around the corner. You autograph hounds always clutter up the entrance. For that, I'll not give you mine. Step aside there. Oh, don't mind him, son. He's just an old ham. A has-been. Oh, that's a heavy hunk of ham. Who is he, Pop? Uh, name's Marvin Masterson. Not the Marvin Masterson. Yep. He's washed up in pictures. Threw on the stage, too. Does bits on the air now. Say, didn't I see him play a butler on Time for Drama tonight? Yep. How the mighty have fallen. Say, Pop, you read that like an actor. Was one once. Oh, nothing like Masterson, of course. And I can appreciate how he must feel. Well, someone else did, too, when he said, Fame, it is the flower of a day that dies when the next sun rises. Yeah. You an actor too, son? Uh, no, writer. Uh, name wouldn't be Dan Holliday, would it? Yes, why? Got a message for you. Uh, from whom? Uh, don't know. Found this note on my desk. If uh, Mr. Dan Holliday comes around, ask him to go to the Mayfair restaurant. Hey, what is this? I'm getting passed around like a, like a collection plate. When you catch up to her, give her a pencil. That lipstick smeared up my call sheet. <laughs> Oh, Monsieur Halliday, it is an honor to have you once more at Mayfair. You have deserted us too long. Working hard, Henri. Always. But tonight, you relax. You have fun, eh, Monsieur Halliday? Hmm? What do you mean? A charming young lady waiting for you at your table. Oh, I'd, I'd hoped you'd come, Mr. Holliday. Why, you're... You're Jean Blake. Yes. I must talk with you. We'll order later, Henri. Now, what is this all about? Oh, I, I suppose I am being rather mysterious. I'm used to mystery. Besides not owning a pencil, what's your problem? Pencil? Yes, that lipstick you write notes with uh, comes off on things. Oh. 
I'm in danger, Mr. Holliday. Grave danger. Well, why come to me? I know about you in Box 13. You advertise adventure wanted. Will go any place, do anything. I need help, so... So? Mr. Holliday, I'm going to be killed. <laughs> I'll do anything you ask, but you must help me. You must. Oh, now, look, Miss Blake, I'm a writer, not a detective. Pardon, I... Monsieur Holliday. Yes, Henri? There's a call for you. May I plug in the phone? A call? Oh, sure. Uh, excuse me, please. Hello? You're engaged in an interesting adventure tonight, aren't you, Mr. Holliday? You must be psychic. Who is this? If seeing into your future is being psychic, I suppose I am. You see, when I ring off, I know you will tell that beautiful young woman sitting next to you that you can't help her. Oh? Surprised? Yeah, a little. What makes you so sure? If you don't send her away, you won't be able to help her. Or anyone else. That I don't see. Something else you don't see is a gun. It's aimed precisely between your eyes. No, don't look around. You can't see it from there. But an expert marksman can see you. However, every move... You're... Uh, you're in this restaurant? Interesting situation, isn't it? Hundreds of people around you, and you don't know which one you're speaking with. Or which will shoot you if you don't do what you're told. Get rid of that girl, Holiday. Now. Now, Miss Blake. You will help me. But, Miss Blake, But I... you must. You simply must. Look, I'll pay you anything. I don't want your money, Miss Blake. I want you to see the police. You won't help me? No. That's final? That's final. Very well. Goodbye, Mr. Holliday. Well, nice going, Holliday. A young woman in distress pleads for help, and what do you do? Send her out into the night alone. But you had to do it, so that that madman on the phone wouldn't hurt somebody. Now you've got to find her and fast. Henri! Henri! Oui, Monsieur Holliday. That girl who just left, Jean Blake. Did you see where she went? Oui, Monsieur. She walked toward the park. Well, this is the park, but no Jean Blake. Oh, there she is. Miss Blake! Miss Blake, wait! It's all right, Miss Blake. It's Dan Holliday. Oh, but I thought... No time for thinking. Get in my car quickly. Oh. Oh, what can I do? What can I do? Oh, now, easy, Miss Blake. Take it easy. There, there. You'll be all right now. Come on, try to be calm. Can you tell me who's been threatening me? Well, there's only one thing we can do. What? Go to the police. You can relax now, Holiday. You're off that hook. The Blake gal's probably back home, and you can bet they put a cop to stand guard at the door. Sure, Holiday, this would have made a great springboard for a yarn. But you're out of it now. So I'll just forget the whole thing. Anyway, what would you have done for the last chapter? Last chapter. Hmm. Of course, uh, if you should go back to the Mayfair for lunch tomorrow, you just might run across something interesting. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.
Ah, oh, aren't you Dan Holiday? Yes. The author? I thought as much. I've seen your pictures on dust jackets of your very exciting books. I'm a fan of yours. Well, have a seat, Mr. Masters. Ah, you recognize me. Have we bumped into one another before? Well, I'd call it a near miss. But along with a few million others, I'd, I'd recognize you anyway. Personally, I detest dining alone. Since no one was with you, I took the liberty. My pleasure, sir. Thank you. Henri, serve my dinner here. Oui, monsieur. Your voice is very distinctive, Mr. Masterson. <laughs> Seems I've heard it just recently. Of course. It was on the radio. I have been doing a bit of that, you know. Simply for amusement, of course. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, I saw you on Gene Blake's show last evening. You played the butler. Ah, uh, yes. I asked them not to credit me. Yes, just dabbling with radio. Uh, a new medium, you see. Oh, I'm sure the name Masterson means a great deal, even to the radio audience. The public soon forgets. I call Monsieur Holliday. The phone is connected. Oh, thank you, honey. Hello? Hello, Mr. Holliday. It, it's going to happen. What I told you about. I know it is. If only you could come now. No! No, don't shoot! Dirk, oh. God. Hello? Hello? Good Lord. Holliday, what's wrong? Jean Blake. She's just been murdered. You are listening to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. And now, back to Box 13, starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. What a sleuth you turned out to be, Holiday. You sit in on a mutual admiration session with a tired old ham actor. And the gal you're trying to protect gets knocked off. Hold it, Mac. Where do you think you're going? To Miss Blake's. Miss Blake ain't seeing nobody. Yeah, that's for sure. She's dead. Dead? Are you crazy, mister? I've been here all the time. Which part of the duplex is hers? Upstairs. But you can't... Come on. Is it? Yes, but I... Come on, bust it in. See what I mean? Suicide, huh? What did she take? Suicide. You better look again. She was shot. That's impossible. I'd have heard something... I've been here six hours and I ain't heard no shot. But there were three shots. I heard them just 15 minutes ago. You heard them? You wasn't here 15 minutes ago. Or was you? Were you? I told you I've been here six hours. Didn't you leave for cigarettes or something? I told you I've been here... Yeah, I know you've been here six hours. But who was around before I got here? No one. That is, nobody but them. Nobody but who? The tenants of the other apartment. An old guy and his daughter, name of Masterson. Masterson? Look, Mac, you know too much about this. I'm holding you till I get the inspector down here. Sure, and when you phone in, tell headquarters to send along a magician's manual. Huh? You didn't hear any shots. This thing must have been done with mirrors. <laughs> Did you talk to Miss Blake after you left her last night? No, not until she phoned me this noon, Inspector. At the restaurant. She phoned you at the restaurant this noon? Yeah, that's right. I was having lunch with a guy from downstairs. Marvin Masterson. Well, I got news for you, Holiday. If you talk to anybody, 
It wasn't Miss Blake. What do you mean? She couldn't have telephoned you. She's been dead over 12 hours. How about that? Holiday. Holiday, where's that good ear you're supposed to have? Sure, you would swear it was Miss Blake's voice. But she was dead 12 hours before. Look, Holiday, you're trying to find the last chapter. But even you couldn't write this one. But it was her voice. Come on now, think, Holiday. What did she say over the phone? It's going to happen. What I told you about, I know it is. If only you could come now. There was something else that came over that wire. Something a good ear would have picked up. If only you could come now. If only you could come now. Think, Holiday, think. What else did you hear over that phone? A clock. A clock sounding the Westminster Abbey chimes. Yes? Miss Masterson? I'm Dan Holliday. Oh, yes. Good evening. Won't you come in? I'm sorry to intrude. Oh, not at all. Father told me he lunched with you this noon. Oh, yes. Is your uh, father at home? No. Oh. Is there something I can do? Oh, yes. Answer a few questions, if you will. Well, if it's about that poor girl upstairs, the police have already questioned Father and me extensively. Poor Father... He was so upset, he went out to our beach cottage for a few days. I'd like very much to know... Can't you get your information from headquarters? No. Why? You see, I know more than the police do. Isn't withholding evidence a crime, Mr. Holliday? Yes. So is aiding and abetting a murder. I'm afraid that's not very clear. Some details are not clear to me. That's why I'm here. Are you insinuating that... No. I'm accusing Accusing whom of what? A father and his daughter of murder and of betting a murder, respectively. That's ridiculous. I don't think so. I get it. This is just a gag cooked up between you and my father. Well, it really isn't very funny. It's no gag. Your father murdered Jean Blake. I believe you helped him, Miss Masterson. And now I'm sure of it. Is my silence that expressive? No, but your clock strikes the Westminster chimes. Chimes? I don't see what they've got to do with it. I see several things. Your fancy record player, for one. It does have an attachment for making recordings, doesn't it? Mr. Holliday, you have no right to ask questions. The police got all the information they wanted. But not the evidence to convict Marvin Masterson. I know he's a murderer. You'll have to prove that. This noon over the phone, I heard Jean Blake calling for help. Then I heard the shots had killed her. Well, if my father was dining with you at the time, how could he be the killer? I heard the murder, but not at the time it was committed. It was you, Miss Masterson, who telephoned me at the restaurant. Are you trying to say I'm clever enough to go through that shooting routine and then fake Gene Blake's voice over the phone? It was Miss Blake's voice, all right. However, I heard it 12 hours after your father killed her in this apartment. Later, he carried her body upstairs. Fantastic. Is it? Mind if I go through this collection of records? I should find the one Gene Blake was forced to cut on this machine before she was shot to death. No, don't, please, I... Oh... You did play that record I heard on the phone. Yes. But I thought it was a joke father was playing on someone. He phoned me a few minutes before and told me what to do. What did you think when you discovered Miss Blake was dead? I was frantic. You see, father warned me to forget all about the record. He refused to answer any of my questions. Mr. Halliday, my father can't be responsible for this tragedy. 
He's just a broken old man. He, he was the idol of millions for so long, and now they don't want him anymore. He, it's breaking his heart. And, please. Please, I'm begging you to forget all about this, Mr. Holliday. I thought you might be innocently involved. But I'm afraid you can't protect your father from a murder charge. What will he do with him? I'm sorry, Miss Masterson, but but I'll have to take that record. Don't touch that cabinet, Holiday. Oh, you didn't like the beach, Masterson. I didn't go. You're too clever to be out of my sight. Being at this end of your gun might indicate otherwise. But I don't like guns pointing at me. Hey, get out of the way. was going to shoot you. Oh, oh, you're so right. Fortunately, you got in the way. Are you convinced now that he killed Miss Blake? Yes. I'm afraid I am. How did you know it was done here, not up in Jean's apartment? Jean didn't have a clock, which strikes the Westminster Abbey chimes. This is Box 13. Starring Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. What is station high? It is a proud vindicate. It boasts and begs. It begs arms of homage from the throng, and off the throng denies its charity. Holiday. Uh, what's that, Inspector? I said that Masterson was a fool. Imagine his insane jealousy of a young performer leading him into a murder plot. Oh, I know, but after all, look at it from Masterson's viewpoint. He'd been a great star, and now he was reduced to playing a bit. Hmm. Support of a girl he considered an upstart. Yeah. Well... Too bad. Yes, his thinking went awry on him. He figured if he got rid of her, they might rebuild the shore around him. Uh, the old boy was nutty as a peck of peanut brittle. Well, Mr. Holliday, should I go over to Star Times and see what's in Box 13? Oh, not this morning, Susie. Today we work. Chapters for our publisher? Chapters for our dear publisher. Good. Oh, say, before we start, there's a letter here for you. A letter? What's it say? It's from the man who owns the apartment building where you live. Yes? It says, your rent is past due. Get it up or get out. Oh, fine. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holliday in Box 13. <laughs> Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures and may currently be seen in Wild Harvest. Box 13 is directed by Ted Hedegar with an original story by Frank Hart Tossig. The part of Susie is played by Sylvia Picker. Original music was composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. This is a Mayfair production. As you know, I've been working to lose weight for a while, but I love bread, which is pretty much 100% carbs. One slice of wheat bread is about 12 carbs. That's 24 carbs if you're making a sandwich, and that's just the bread before you put anything into the sandwich. But I saw an ad online for Hero Bread that claimed zero carbs. I was skeptical. I tried other zero-carb breads in the past that were absolutely horrid. But I clicked and ordered a loaf of their seed bread and their white bread. Not only did it feel and taste like actual bread, I've gone back to making sandwiches like I did before my low-carb diet. I can have a grilled cheese without worry. I make many pizzas by toasting the white bread and using it like pizza crust. So I went back and found that Hero Bread also has hot dog buns, so I jumped on that. Again, zero carbs. 
They have zero-carb hamburger buns, dinner rolls, tortillas, and more, even croissants. I asked them if I could please work with them and they said yes, so now you can get Hero Bread by visiting WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. And if you create a subscription, you can even save 10% on everything you order. If low carb is your life right now, try Hero. WeirdDarkness.com slash Hero. The National Broadcasting Company invites you by transcription to join the chase. There is always the hunter and the hunted, the pursuer and the pursued. It may be the voice of authority or a race with death and destruction, the most relentless of the hunters. There are times when laughter is heard as counterpoint and moments when sheer terror is the theme. But always there is the chase. Inspector Donnelly speaking. Oh, send Detective Nielsen right in, please. Nielsen? Yes, sir. I'm Inspector Donnelly. Come in, sit down. And never mind the sir, I'm beginning to feel old enough as it is. Uh, cigarette? Thanks. Have a good trip from the coast? Oh, good enough if you like planes. Personally, I don't think they'll ever replace the horse. <laughs> trip a little bumpy, eh? Well, uh, ran into a storm. My liver's still quivering. I brought you east because they tell me you're one of the best cops on the West Coast. You've handled some tough assignments, but the one I'm asking you to take right now will probably be your toughest and most dangerous. Um, did you say asking? I did. I'm used to taking orders, not requests. This thing is so rough, you may want out, and I wouldn't blame you. If you don't like the smell of it, I've got your return ticket to LA here in my desk. Um, well, suppose you tell me about it. Let me munch it over. Ever hear of Red Monks? Uh, Monks, Monks, uh... Oh, yes, wasn't he mixed up in running narcotics? Well, narcotics was only a hobby. He took a crack at everything in the book. We finally got him as a fourth offender. Mm -hmm. well, what about this, Monks? First of all, he's a classic example of the criminal mind. Hard as granite, vicious, and the conscience of a leopard. He's the kind of a cookie who can stab a man in the back and then use the same knife to butter his toast. Sounds like a charmer. Well, we've got Red Monks, but we haven't got his boss. We're sure he was working for someone, a Mr. Big, who controls three quarters of the rackets between here and Chicago. Where do I come in? I'm sending you on a chase, Nielsen, a chase for information. And it may be the roughest chase you ever entered. I picked you for the job for two reasons. One, your record. Two, and just as important, you're not known here on the East Coast. What's the setup, Inspector? Now, we picked up a con named Johnny Hagen several days ago. He's got a long list of suspected felonies behind him, and we'll probably be able to put him away for 190 years. His arrest hasn't been made known yet, however. Oh. Oh, I'm beginning to see where this rhubarb is leading. Now, Higgins was a lone wolf. He always worked by himself. Very few of the underworld have ever even seen him. And you want me to impersonate Hagen? Is that the deal? Exactly. We'll throw you in the clink and team you with monks in his cell. No one will know your real identity except me. Mm -hmm. Even the prison guards will think you're in stir on an armed robbery rap. Then you can start to get to know monks, win his confidence. After a while, he may give you the information we want. Uh, sounds great. It won't be a picnic. If Monks finds out who you really are, he'll strangle you right there and then inside the cell. He's built like a grain silo, incidentally, with basketball muscles. Now, this gets better as it goes along. Now, as I said before, you can take it or leave it, and there'll be no hard feelings. How much time do I have to think it over? Five minutes. <laughs> Five years would make it easier. Well, sorry you had to make the trip. I'll try to find someone else. Thanks for coming, anyway. Uh... 
Inspector, did you, uh, did you say you had a plane ticket in that desk? Yes. Well, I told you that, uh, planes and I don't get along. Uh, when, uh, when do I get into prison, Gray? You'll accept? Against my better judgment and common sense. We'll be ready to ship you up the river in the morning. Now, here's a complete file on Johnny Hagen with pictures. You'll find everything you need to know about him in that folder. Study it hard. I'll memorize it word for word, Inspector. Good luck, Nielsen. Oh, uh, just one more thing. Yes, Inspector? Are you married? No. So you don't have to worry about uh, making a widow out of some innocent girl. <laughs> What have you got in your head? None of your lousy business. Look, one more crack like that and I'll have you on the carpet. Now, what do you got in your hand? Five fingers. <laughs> the last time, monks, what are you holding in your hand? Why don't you come in and see, Tootsie? Come on in, we'll have a party. I'll bust every bone in your stinking head. Are you a... All right, Monks. The warden will get a report about this. You want to know what I got in my hand, Jake? A cigarette. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, mister. And when you see the warden, give my regards. Tell him to drop dead. <laughs> Shut up! No more noise, see? I want quiet from everybody. I'm going to get some sleep. In here, Hagen. Behave yourself. Open 27. My name is Hagen. So what? So I'm telling you. Hagen. What kind of name is that? You haven't been around much, have you, Monks? I've been around long enough to know a slob when you see one. Look, I didn't ask to be put in here with you, but as long as we're together, we might as well make the best of it. <laughs> sure, why not? Shake, Hagen. Okay with me, I'll shake. Oh, hey. <laughs> not a bad grip I got, eh? But... You know, a little more pressure, like this. Hardy. I can bust your finger bones one by one. <laughs> yell quits. Go on, yell quits. Hey, what's going on in there? Nothing. We was just shaking hands, that's all. Was he trying to pull something, Hagen? No. You sure? He's practically up for solitary now. All I need is one more excuse. I wouldn't give you an excuse to breathe, Stooley. Another tough guy, huh? You're well made. That's Benson, the head guard. If I could get my paws around that screw's throat just once. Yeah, but my time is coming. Oh, boy, and how. Why don't you tell him I was squeezing the juice out of that hand of yours, Hagen? Why don't you stay out of my head? <laughs> you ain't half bad. You took that squeeze without a squawk. I brung guys to their knees that way, Hagen. You're long on muscle, monks, but short on brains. What? You heard me. If your brains weren't scrambled, you'd have known who Johnny Hagen is. All right. Who is he? Find out for yourself. And when you do, maybe I'll accept your apology. I'll get myself 40 winks. I've been up all night. Sure. <laughs> I'll find out, Hagen. I'll get a pitch on you when we're in the yard for free time. This afternoon. All right, all right. The next 
No, you're on your own. And no rough stuff. I tell you, folks, Johnny Hagen is one of the best. What makes you so sure, Choppers? Ain't you never heard of him? No. Oh, he's as brainy as they come. Pulled at least 25 jobs without even the police getting a line on him. Well, he ain't no rod heister like us, Red. He, he's slick as molasses. You ever seen him before? No. And hardly nobody ever seen a guy. He always worked alone. Mostly on the West Coast, I think. Oh, here he comes now. Hey, Hagen. You calling me? Why don't you meet a pal of mine? Biff Dogan. They call me Choppers. And I kind of, most of my teeth is missing. Uh, hiya, Hagen. Hi. Choppers has been telling me some interesting stuff about you, Hagen. Oh, you don't say. I hear you big time on a coast. Big enough. What do you want for? Robbery. <laughs> Did you hold up a push cart? Sure. <laughs> Only the push cart was full of rocks and they called it Peelman's. Peelman's? You mean a Fifth Avenue jewelry store? I told you he was big time, Red. Ain't nobody take a crack at Peelman's before. They got a safety alarm for every rock. Yeah, sure. But the sucker got caught, didn't he? Nobody caught me, Monks. The stoolie turned me in. A stoolie? Yeah, but his talking days are over. I told a pal of mine to wrap him in a cake of cement, drop him in the river. I'd have torn him apart. Fine, stoolies make me so crazy, man. Yeah, I could... Easy, Red. Easy. The guard's watching us. Yeah... He'll watch himself right into a wooden kimono one of these. Oh, we'll take care of him when the time comes. Hey, that reminds me, Ren. Don't you think that we ought to let Hagen in? Shut or, your yap. Or I was Shut up. Well, sure. Anything you say, Red. Oh, boy. Um, let me in on what? Next Wednesday's my birthday. I'm going to let you blow out the candles on my cake. <laughs> you don't trust me much, do you, Mark? Why should I trust you? I didn't know you from a hole in the wall before today. Uh, we'll get to know each other better as time goes on, and we'll have plenty of that. Maybe not as long as you think. What? When I figure you're a right guy, Hagen, you're in. But not before, see? <laughs> Hello, Nielsen. Come in. Don't mind my saying so, Inspector. You were taking a chance getting me over here. Well, it worked out all right, didn't it? Well, I, uh, I punched a guard and the other prisoners thought they put me in solitary, but uh, since you had to explain my position to the head guard and the warden, you are... Well, you aren't the only one who knows my identity now. Uh, we can rely on them. Anyway, it can't be helped. Has Muggs done any talking yet? No. No, he's a closed mouth character and not half as dumb as he looks, Inspector. I've gotten the first base, however. We're becoming friends. And, uh, by the way, he got a kick out of seeing me smack that guard. He'll probably give me a big welcome when I get back. But you haven't gotten any dope yet. Well, nothing concrete about his boss outside. But, uh, there's something cooking, though. Oh? Yeah, there's some kind of a deal on inside the prison. Only monks and two or three others know what it is. I'm trying to find out what he's up to. Yes. Well, keep at it. Oh, he's a tough baby, Inspector. And, uh, by the way, you're right. He's as strong as an ox. Yeah. He showed off for me once by bending the iron leg of his sleeping cot and then bending it back into shape again. It made my skin crawl to think of what those hands could do if they curl themselves around my throat. Be careful, Nielsen. I'm walking on eggs, Inspector. He's hard to reach. You know, he's like a wild animal. He's instinctively cautious about everything. Yeah. Well, I won't get you out of there again until we've got what we want. It's too risky. Meanwhile, keep plugging. Right. Goodbye, Nielsen. Oh, uh, Inspector. Yes? I want to smuggle a gun inside the cell. A gun? Unload it, of course. And I'll make sure Monks never gets his hands on it. I think I can make a big impression on him if I flash it. Well, that's a highly unusual thing to do. So is my assignment. Yeah. All right, I'll check with the warden and see that you're given a service revolver without shells. Fine. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> back to stud, copper. I got a little business with a con. Inside, Higgin. Uh, 
<laughs> Back, huh? Yeah. How'd you like solitary? It was worth it for a crack at that guard. I gotta hand it to you, Hagen. You done what I've been dying to do for months. Yeah, well, I um, did even better, Max. Look. Hey. You got a Roscoe. Uh-huh. I made a deal with a trusty. He swiped it from the gun room. You're a smart operator, Hagen. Well, it's about time you start to find that out. Uh, let me have it. What the rod, nothing doing. All right, Hagen. I'm going to let you in on something big. Up to now, I wasn't sure of you, Hagen. But I changed my mind. What's up? I got a break planned. Break? It's coming off today. We got 18 cons in on a deal, and the rest will tag along. This whole cell block's going to bust out right after we come back from the yard. You can't break out of this joint, Red. It's a crazy idea. If you don't want it, all right. But I tell you, I got it all fixed. Just before they close the sound block, we're jumping the guards. And then we get into the gun room for rods. And then out we go. How are you going to get past the wall guards, Red? <laughs> I got a friend on the outside. He's sending two cars. They'll have phony official tags. They'll get in through the gate. They'll take care of the wall guards from there. Uh, what uh, makes you so sure you can count on this friend? His cars will show up. What's his name? Why? Well, I just uh, want to make sure who I'm dealing with. You don't have to know his name, Hagen. If I can count on him, you can. Okay, I'll take your word for it. It still looks shaky to me. I'm telling you, we can handle it. It's all mapped out on this diagram. What everybody does when I give the signal, can't miss. Hey, let's see that diagram. Hoist the, the rod. Nothing doing. What's the matter, Hagen? Don't you trust me? I can handle a rod as good as any guy, and I'll take care of this one. All right. Well, listen, if anything goes wrong, you got to use that gun, you understand? Sure. I ain't standing for any slip-ups on this, remember that? Yeah, you can depend on me, Red. Okay. Is the uh, guard up the line now? I don't see him around. All right. Then come over here in the corner. We'll go over this diagram together. I'll show you how we're going to wake it. Move by move. Were you all set, Red? Yeah. And don't make any mistakes, Chappers. Oh, you can depend on me, poor... Where's Hagen? Oh, he was over there in the corner of the yard a minute ago. I gotta talk to him once more. Oh, there he is, walking in the wall. I want to see him. You keep your eye on me, Chuck. All right, all right, you guys. Break it up, break it up. Oh, Benson. Well? Take a message to the warden. I just found... Hagen! Look, like this is free time, ain't it, Benson? What's the idea of pushing me around? I can talk, can I? Just lay off me, that's all. Okay, okay, that's What's the trouble, Hagen? I was giving me needles for no reason at all. I hate every one of them. In half an hour, you'll be twisting his arm out. For a minute, though, I almost thought you was getting cozy with that story. Listen, Monks, I stood for a lot from you before we got to be buddies, but you can go too far if you're saying I got chummy with a prison guard. All right, all right. Keep your shirt on. You can't blame me for being yippy. This thing is big. Well, set for it? Yeah. The boys down the line got their orders. I'll take care of Benson personally. He's the one who's going to help us get into the gun room. Hold it! All right, here we go, Hagen. When we come to a halt outside the cell block, I'll give the signal. Hey, where are you going? Getting into line. Come here. What's the matter? You march in front of me anyway. Why don't you get close with that rod, Hagen, when a fireworks start? All right, 
inside, men. I said inside. Let's go! Come on, Bensoner, you're losing an arm. You'll never get away with this month. Ah, look, we got the whole block out, mister. Your pals are going to take it easy inside themselves for a chance. Take it. Oh, yeah, Mike. Come on. We're heading for the gun room with this story. Everything all right down the line? Three of the guards got away. How'd that happen? I told them, Jerk, just with the dough. How many we got left? Not counting this one. Just two. They're both cold inside one of the cells. All right, Stoney. Oh. Take us to the gun room and make it snappy. <laughs> Open this door, Benson. You got a key. I'll open nothing, you... I can tear it right out of the socket if I want now, and so help me undo it, too. Look, the key is in my left-hand pocket. All right, take it away from him, Hagen. Don't move, Stoli. Don't move. He can hardly breathe right now. Quick, grab that key. Hey, what's that? Sounds like Tommy guns to me. Tommy guns? Inside the cell block? It can't be. Hey. I got 50 guards in the cell block, guys I've never seen before. Oh, there must have been a leak. Somebody squealed. They must have put all them guards on today. Yeah. Hey, grab this guy, Choppers. Uh, Give me the key, Higgins. Look, Red, we fizzled out. We're the only ones still loose. We haven't got a chance. I'll see who ain't got a chance. Give me the key. There's hardly anything left in here. They must have taken out all the heavy stuff for the extra guards. We'll make it fast, Red. They'll get on top of us some man. Okay. Here's a rod for you, Chavis. I'll take this Tommy gun. That's all that's left. What about me, Red? You already got a rod. We're coming down, Red. We'll block ourselves inside the guard's mess hall. It's the only place we can go from here. Come on. Make sure that bolt's in tight, Chavis. It's solid, Red. I'll make a deal with you, Monks. Give yourself up and I'll ask the warden... The only deal I'm making with you, Stoney, is this crime. Uh, are you crazy, Monks? You want to face a murder rap? That sock on the skull had just put him to sleep for a while. He'll be all right. <laughs> I ain't happy enough to get rid of our one chance to make a deal. What do you mean? As long as we get the guard, they won't try to blast us out of here. Open up, man! Sure, copy! That's it, Cappy. Now, right, listen, we got Benson in the guard in here. You try to rush us and he gets his head blown off. <laughs> you got him quiet, all right. What do we do now, Muggs? We wait. For what? A deal. What kind of a deal you think we'll get? I don't know. But I'm playing it for all it's worth. This guy's got a wife and two kids. The warden ain't forgetting that. Bunks! Monks, can you hear me? This is the warden, speaking from the tower. Throw your guns out of the window and open those doors. You haven't got a chance. <laughs> we'll see. Monks, for the last time, throw out your guns and open the doors. If the guard walks out and you haven't harmed him, we'll go easy on you. Yeah, he'll go easy on us, all right. Chappers. Yeah, Red. Uh... Keep your eye on Benson. If he comes to, make sure he don't move. I'm going to have a talk with the warden from the side of the window. <laughs> warden? This is Monks. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm giving you ten minutes to clear the guards out of the hall and open the outside gate. And then we're walking out of here with Benson. If you start shooting as we leave, Benson gets it. Remember, ten minutes, and I made business, too. You must be stir crazy, Monks, to make a demand like that. It ain't half as crazy as it sounds. Well, Benson's a shield, I'll let us throw. Yeah, when we get on the outside, then what? You think you can outrun a dozen squad cars? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I don't, at least I can take Benson along. Before they give it to me, I give it to him. Besides, Fletcher sent two cars. They didn't try to come in, maybe because they caught wise or something went wrong, but they're waiting out there someplace. Fletcher. Oh, you, you mean uh, Arnold Fletcher, the, the guy who owns that string of nightclubs from here to the coast? <laughs> nightclubs are a front for Ron. He's got bigger takes. 
Well, now you know, Hagen. You always wanted to know who my boss was. You satisfied? Arnold Fletcher. Yeah, he's, uh, he's pretty big time, Monks. And he's smart, too. Smart? Ha! He's the smartest. In public, he's a VIP. A solid citizen. You ever see a list of the charities he gives Dodo? Ha! He plays it better than it was ever played before, that guy. Hey, Benson's coming around, right? All right, yank it to his feet. Come on. Up! Stooley! Bunks, this is the warden again. We're not opening any gates, and that's final. This is your last chance to give yourselves up. You hear that, Benson? The warden ain't making any deals. You know what I means? You take the rap. You're going to kill me? What place? Now, Marx, listen. We've been chased right into a corner. We're finished. If you add murder to everything else, we'll all get the chair. Not me. After I take care of Benson, I walk out shooting. I got a few more before I'm through. Oh, well, man, that's suicide. So man. what? It's better to spend the rest of your life in stir, ain't it? And you're really off your trolley. I can see it now. You can't say nothing, you fathead. And you're shooting your way out of here along with Hagen or me. But first comes Benson no, here. No, no. How do you want it, Copper? In the back? Or right where I'm pointing. I got a family. Don't shoot, Monks. Don't let him kill me, Nielsen. N- Nielsen? Monks, how come he called Hagen Nielsen? I'll tell you how come, you lunky. Uh, because Hagen's a stoolie. He's a cop. A cop? Nielsen, Nielsen. Niel- Nielsen, there's a guy named Nielsen out on the coast. A detective. Yeah, that's who we've been palling around with, Chappers. Chappers, look. You're not a lifer like monks. You're in for a ten-year stretch. Play ball with me and I'll get you parole. Parole? You thinking it over, Chappers? Oh, I, I don't know. He, he's right, monks. I, I mean, I ain't a lifer. And a parole will look fine, huh? Even if you double cross the path. I wouldn't double cross. All right, here's a fast All right. And you're next, Nielsen. Here's what every stool he gets for a payoff. Stand up. Stand up. Ah! Ah! Nielsen, they got monks from outside. Yeah. There's a guard on the opposite wall with a rifle and a telescopic sight. When monks backed up to the window, the guard was able to get a crack at him. Nielsen, are you all right? It's Inspector Donnelly in the squad. Unbolt that door, will you, Benson? Yeah, yeah. I came over as soon as I heard about the break. Uh, who's this, lying next to Monks? His sidekick. They call him Choppers. Well, I got the information you needed just before the finish, Inspector. Arnold Fletcher's the man you want. Fletcher? Well, I'll... Yeah. yeah. Two of his cars may be outside right now, waiting for Monks. I'll have the area searched. It's a lucky thing you made that suggestion about extra guards to the warden. He was all ready for the break when it came. Well, I got to get back to the yard. Everything's under control, Nielsen, and you've done a fine job. I'm going to recommend you for a promotion. Um, there's one more thing you can do for me, Inspector. Name it. Well, uh, change that plane ticket for a train. Huh? I've had about all the bumps tonight that I can handle. <laughs> In the animal world, there is the hunter and the hunted. Hound and fox, hawk and sparrow, chicken and worm. But who is to judge precisely which is the pursuer or the pursued as we enter the chase? The chase was created and written for the National Broadcasting Company by Lawrence Clee. Heard in the cast were Larry Haynes, Ralph Bell, Bernard Lenro. Kermit Murdoch, and Ken Williams. The chase is directed and transcribed by Fred Way. Fred Collins speaking. Next week, an innocent man is railroaded into the death house by an ambitious murderer who learns there is no escape from retribution in The Chase. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting...
While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, to visit sponsors you hear about during the show, sign up for my newsletter, enter contests, connect with me on social media, hear other podcasts that I host, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression, dark thoughts, or addiction. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Will NASA help Scotland search for the Loch Ness Monster? Is it possible that time doesn't really exist? Can you find true love and marriage with a ghost? How can a pothole revive the dead? These are just some of the questions I have in my new YouTube series, Mind of Marlar. It's full of the strange and macabre as you'd expect from my Weird Darkness podcast, but with an added twist of humor, satire, and absurdity. If you like comedy and creepiness, check out Mind of Marlar on YouTube or visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Mind of Marlar. M&J Audio Theater presents Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Well, now. Ah, come in, my friend. Yes, have a seat, won't you? There. Ah, there you are. <laughs> My name is Chet Chetter. I'm the morgue attendant and uh, resident storyteller. Uh, we here at the morgue have just bought a new computer. I'm trying to transfer the information from our old filing system. Now then, let's see. Press S for store and then enter. Oh, drat. Failed again, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm not mentally equipped for this sort of thing. Computers and technical manuals and such. Uh, however, I do recall a story about a young man who knew this technology very well. Yes, uh, he lived in a two-story house in the country, and not too far from a big city. I think he even went so far as to put a laboratory on the second floor. Mm-hmm. There we go. Let's see now. I'll just adjust the transmitting signal. Adjust the head size. Accelerate the receiving coordinates to 17. Yeah. There it is. It is finally complete. My greatest invention. Now... All I need is a guinea pig to test it on. Hey! Hey, main brain! Ah. Hey, you moron, you up there goofing off with me in here? Oh. Uh, yes. Yes, brother. I'm upstairs. Uh, come up here. I have something I want to show you. Oh, oh yeah? Oh, well, the excitement's killing me. I can't wait. Hey, you've been up here all day playing with the stupid chemistry set, hey, you little geek. <laughs> It is a laboratory, brother. I need it for my work. I'm an inventor. No, no, wrong, wrong. You ain't no inventor, because you never sold nothing. Uh, you know why you never sold nothing? Because these inventions are usually crap, that's why. Oh, well, now that hurts, brother. Well, when are you going to wise up, eh? Why don't you go out and find a job and bring some money into this house? Now, brother, I do contribute to this house. I have that job at the library. Oh, that's nickel and dime stuff. That, that ain't nothing. Hey, I'll tell you what I can do. I, I can put in a good word for you up there at Tino's, all right? Oh. I mean, he needs a guy that's good with numbers. Uh, you can count money, can't you? No, thanks, brother. And uh, Perhaps working for a loan shark is okay for you, but uh, organized crime doesn't interest me. You little pinhead, you got the right to talk like that to me? Ah! Ah! ah my head! Now, look what you've done. You've broken a beaker ah. of hydrochloric acid. Ah. It burns! It burns! Well, of course it burns. It's acid. Ah. Here, here, give me your ah, hand. No. Easy, easy. Ah. Let me put this ointment on it. Ah. There you go. Ah. Now, isn't that better? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that is better. Yes. Yeah. I invented this ointment, you know. It immediately counteracts acid burns. 
But wait till you see my latest invention, brother. Oh, no, no. I ain't interested. Buzz off. Now, don't be hasty. Let me fix you a drink. And now you're talking. I could use a drink. Yes, I thought so. You could always use one. Here you go. Yeah. Drink it down. It'll make you feel better. There you go. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. I feel better already. Yeah. I still want you to buzz off, though. <laughs> hey, hey, what's that you got in your hand there? Oh, this is my new invention, brother. I call it the Lobometer. Yeah. It is capable of transforming even a man like yourself into a genius. <laughs> Looks like a football helmet. <laughs> yeah. Shall we try the helmet on? Hey, get the thing away from me. I ain't putting it on. I'm afraid I must insist, brother. Hey! Uh, ah, hey, get, get this thing off my head! Uh, ah! I, easy? I can't move! Yes. Hey! Did, did you put something in my drink, you crazy moron? Uh, it, it's a very harmless drug, brother. It causes only temporary paralysis. Uh, now, if this works, we'll both be very, very uh, rich. Won't that be nice, brother? Well, what are you going to do to me, huh? Well, now, observe. I only want to explain this once. This is a computer keyboard, you see. And this is a disk drive. And this is a transmitting cord. It links the computer to the helmet. Look, look. You take it off my head now, and I won't kill you later, I promise. <laughs> now, don't be silly, brother. I'm going to wake up that sleeping brain of yours. Now, you see this? It is a floppy disk. It contains an entire dictionary. I'm going to send this information through the helmet into your brain in less than ten seconds. Are you ready, brother? Get this thing off my head! I knew you'd be ready. Now, we'll just switch the helmet on. Ah, hey, my head's vibrating! Ah. Ah, it works. Goody, goody. Now, I'll place the floppy disk into the disk drive, press a few keys... And then initiate the transmission procedure. Hold on, brother. Your brain is about to take a little ride. Take it off. Take it off. I don't... Ah! Hey, what was that? What was that? It is pulses of information, computerized information going into your brain. Take it easy now, brother. My head. Easy. What did you do to my head? Now, now easy now. Your brain has just received a vast amount of information. It needs time to process it all. Uh, how do you, uh, how do you feel? Uh, like someone kicked me in the head. <laughs> hey, take this thing off of me, jug face. Oh, yes, yes, of course, of course. Uh, there you go. Hey, hey, I think I can move now. Well, of course. I told you the paralysis was only temporary. Yeah. Yeah, well, that's too bad for you. <laughs> Brother, uh, let go of my neck. Uh, I can't breathe. Yeah, yeah, well, that's the idea, Egghead. You're catching on. Yeah, I get a little irritated when someone tries to kill me. Uh, no, no, brother, no. I've made you smarter. Yeah, well, I don't feel no smarter. It feels like my brain's been fried or something. I know what your game is. You tried a thing on me to see if it works right, huh? No. You could have killed me. No. Hey, demophobia, brother, demophobia. Huh? What did you say? Uh, uh, demophobia, brother. Oh, now you're calling me names, eh? You got all the nerve in the world, you little... Oh, no. Ow. no, brother, no. Demophobia. Uh, Think a minute, you know the word. Uh, demophobia. Demo... Yeah. Yeah, I do know that word. Demophobia. An unnatural fear of crowds. Derived from the Greek word demos. Yes, Hey, hey, I never heard that word before. Yes, brother. You have a detailed knowledge of thousands of words now. Uh, and that's just the beginning. Uh, anything that can be stored on computer software can be sent through the helmet into the human brain. Uh. Imagine the possibilities. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm imagining all right. <laughs> I'm imagining some very beneficial uses for that little gadget of yours. Huh? <laughs> Beneficial. <laughs> I'm word smart. Now, now, I don't like that look in your eyes, brother. Yeah. The lobometer is to benefit society. Yeah? Well, to hear what's the sign. I'm looking out for numero uno. You got that? I got some plans for that thing of yours. <laughs> and you're going to help me, right? What? What are you talking about? Well, uh, don't the banks keep credit card and checking account numbers in the computer? No. No. I will not use the lobometer for that. You're going to do it exactly <laughs> like I tell you. You understand? You're going to start earning your keep <laughs> around here. Brother, please, don't shove me like that. I'm getting too close to the window. Maybe I don't even need you, huh? <laughs> Maybe I can work this computer gadget myself. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, how can it be? Brother, please, the window. You're going to do it exactly <laughs> like I tell you. <laughs> You're going to... Uh, brother... <laughs> uh, that stupid moron. 
broke a perfectly good window. <laughs> Well, now, this is just a wonderful situation to be in. Two broken legs, a broken arm, mm. and being pushed around like an invalid in a wheelchair. Yeah, well, that's what you get for taking a dive out of a second-story window. <laughs> you are shoving me. Ah, yes. shut up. Before I push you the wrong way down a one-way street or something. Very well. Now, here we are at the credit bureau, okay? Uh -huh. Remember how our little game's gonna be played? Ah, yes. We're going to pretend, aren't we? Yeah, that's right. You got that helmet thing ready? Well, of course. It's been in my lap all this time. You know, I'm not exactly thrilled about entering a life of crime with you. Yeah, well, you're gonna do it, though, ain't you? Yes. You know, I wasn't exactly thrilled about being drugged up yesterday. Ah, uh, you're never going to let me live that down, are you? I'm not gonna let you live at all if you don't shut up. Uh, very well, brother, very well. It appears I'm at your mercy in this chair. Huh. Yeah. <laughs> at my mercy. I like the sound of that. <laughs> Yeah, I try to keep it that way. Now, now, clam up, all right? Yes. We're going to go over to that broad at the computer desk over there, and I'll do all the talking. Oh, of course, brother. Talking is your forte, isn't it? Hello. Welcome to Big City Credit Bureau. I am Patty. May I help you? Well, hello, Patty. Uh, actually, we're here to help you. We're from Citywide Computer Repair. Oh. We come to give your system the once-over. Oh. And by the way, that is a lovely shade of lipstick, Pam. Well, well, thank you. It's lavender, you know. Uh. Uh, well, actually, I think our computers are running fine. Well, uh, it may appear that way, Patty, but... Mm. Uh... You ever hear of a computer virus? No. They're nasty little devils. They get in a computer program, and just when you think things are running fine, zap! Ooh. It completely erases. Well... Now, would you want to be responsible for that? Oh... Oh, my, my, no. Well, of course you wouldn't. I can see you're an intelligent girl. So we'll just go about our business, all right? Uh, Assistant Bernard, mm -hmm. uh, hand me that helmet, would you? Of course. Here you are. Um, uh, pardon me, but uh, what is that you're putting on your head? Uh, it's of a highly technical nature, uh, Patty. Uh, let's call it a glitch detector, yeah. Oh, I see. Um, uh, hook it up to the computer, would you, uh, Assistant Bernard? Oh, yes, I'd be delighted to. Thank you. Now, Patty, my assistant here is going to need to use your computer for a couple of seconds, if you don't mind. Oh, oh, no. Uh, uh, you're the expert, so I'll just stand back and watch. Okay, you do that. You're a lovely girl. Eh, we got to get to some of those nasty viruses now. Uh, assistant Bernard, uh, see if you can find the credit card numbers. Ah, uh, yes, very well, very uh, well. And uh, 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 pardon my intrusion, but uh, mm. why do you need the credit card numbers? Oh, hey, Patty, those nasty computer viruses, they head right for those credit card numbers. They mm. like those the best. Oh, oh, I see, I see. Ah, uh, here we are. I found the numbers. Huh. We're ready for transmission. Turn the helmet on. All right, here we go. Uh, oh, Oh, here we are. Oh, wow, what a blast. Oh. All right, we're approaching the first pulse now. Here we go. Here we go. Hold on. Here it comes. Oh, my. There you are. Second pulse coming. Hold on. Here we go. Right now. Oh, my heavens. Hey, 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 it worked. Oh, yeah. All those names and numbers in my head, clear as day. Um... It's like they were always there. Um, I'm afraid uh, to ask, but, uh, uh, how does it look? Well, uh, well, Patty, I'm delighted to announce that your computer is completely free of viruses and glitches. Oh, okay. And I also want to thank you for cooperating during our little test here. Oh, well, it was very, very interesting. I just wish I knew what you were doing. Well, uh... Why don't you give me your card, and I'll send you some pamphlets and some brochures explaining how all this stuff works. Um, sir, don't you think we should go now? We uh, have other appointments. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess we should go. Uh, huh. Well, Patty, it's been lovely meeting your acquaintance. Well, it's been very, very nice meeting you, too. I suppose you'll just uh, send us a bill, right? Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, we'll send you a bill, yeah. All right. So long, Patty. Bye-bye. Yeah. That Patty's my kind of girl. Yes, yes, I figured she would be, brother. Five, six, seven, 
eight, nine, ten. Yeah. Yeah, look at that. Ten thousand dollars. Look at that pile of lettuce, eh? Mm. Not bad for two days, eh, little brother? Oh, it's wonderful. You've managed to turn a great invention into a tool of evil in only two days. Yeah. I congratulate you, brother. Yeah, now, you better be careful. Mm. I know sarcasm when I hear it. Oh, yes. I'm a walking dictionary. Now, get me a beer before uh. I kick those crutches out from under you. Uh, uh, of course, of course. Yeah. yeah, I tell you, these credit card numbers was only the beginning. They got everything on these computer software disk things now. Look at this. Look at the stuff I stole from the computer store. How to win at poker, roulette, craps. <laughs> I'll clean house at Vegas. Well, uh, gambling is legal in Las Vegas, brother. That's hardly your style, is it? What did I tell you about that sarcasm? Oh, I'm sorry. Let's see how you walk with one crutch. No. Uh, ow. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. oh, dear. Me, yeah, though. yeah, you better learn to watch that smart tongue of yours. The yeah. life you see could be your own. Uh, yes. Yeah. Here's your beer. Yeah, For... yeah, yeah, give it here. And it better not spew up in my face when I open it either. <coughs> yeah, who the hell could that be? Shall I, shall I crawl to the door and find out for you, brother? No, no, just stay there and dummy up. Yeah, and get lost. Nobody's here. Open up, Bruno. The yeah. boss wants to talk to you. Yeah. It's rat face Charlie. Uh, all right. All right, I'm coming. Well, hey. Hey, rat face yeah. Boss. Mm. Hey, hey, come on in out of the rain. Thanks. I, uh, hadn't seen you in a while, Bruno. Yeah. Thought I'd better come check on you, see if you was sick or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you ain't sick, are you, Bruno? Oh, no, I'm, I'm not sick, boss. I, I forgot to tell you. Can, can you believe it? I, I actually found the job. <laughs> well, you found a job. Yeah, I found a job. Well, ain't that beautiful? Yeah, huh? it's pretty. I found yeah. a job. <laughs> now, Bruno... You were shining shoes for dimes when I found you. Yeah, shining shoes for dimes. I cut you in on some very sweet deals. Now, yeah. if you found something, I'd like a little share of it. Yeah, share of it, Bruno, share of it. Okay, all right, I, I'm going to cut the strings right now. I, I ain't working for you no more, you uh -huh. hear me? I got my own thing now, I don't need yous no more. You find some other bum to do your dirty work. You, you dirty... Backstabbing. You, you got some nerve using that tone with me. Hey, 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 boss, put down the gun, huh? Yeah, yeah, blow his brains out, boss. Now start talking. Tell me what kind of deal you found, Bruno, and I might let you live. Listen, boss, it ain't like that. I'm tired of talking. <laughs> Dirty. Bob. Bob. You shot the boss. You killed him. Yeah. I never touched him. I shot him. Uh, and there's plenty where that came from, so I suggest you leave now. You're, you're dead. Yeah. Yeah, wait till, wait till the gang finds out. You're dead, both of you. Dead. Dead. Red, red face. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. You're dead. I can't believe you did it. Well, if you're going to have a gun, brother, I suggest you keep it with you. I found this in a dresser drawer. Oh, God, are we in trouble now? I had no choice. I had to shoot him. He would have killed you and myself as well, more than likely. Uh, One less mobster in the world. Uh, now, brother, uh, take the body to the river and dump him there. Uh, take the back roads. Don't draw attention to yourself. Drive the speed limit. I, I can't do that. Do it, brother. You have to do it. For once in your life, listen to me. When the police find the body, they'll think it's just another mob hit. That's all. Uh, However, if you're leaving bleeding here on the front porch, that might draw suspicion. All right, all right, all right. I'll do it, I'll do it. What... What are we going to do? What are we going to do about... About them? They're going to come after us. I'll think of something, brother. Believe me. I'll... I'll think of something. Yes. Indeed, he did think of something. The meek little inventor was unwillingly pulled into a life of crime and deception. And now he had taken the life of another man. 
The shocking thing was that he was beginning to enjoy this new lifestyle. He had invented something that was turning an enormous profit. And committing a criminal act was thrilling. Still, he wanted to be in charge of his destiny. He wanted to be the boss. And only one man stood in his way. He knew exactly what to do about that problem. Here we are. Ah. There. I believe that will work. Now, I just need to tighten the screw on this transmitting circuit. Ah. There. Already. Ah. You've returned, brother. Yeah. I trust you got rid of the corpse. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I got rid of it. I dumped it in the river just like you said. Good. You weren't seen, were you? No. No, no, there wasn't no traffic or nothing. There's, uh, there's blood in the trunk, though. Mm. Not much, but, uh, but you can still see it. Well, uh, I'll take care of that later. I'm, I'm sorry that I had to put you through all this, brother, but it's your own fault for not choosing a better class of people to play with. I don't need your lip. I need a drink. Well, I'm sorry, brother. We're all out of liquor. What? You forgot to go to the liquor store again, didn't you, you little twerp? We we got to get out of here. We're not uh, going anywhere. We're staying right here. But they're going to come after us for killing the boss. Let them come. I know how to handle apes like that. You think they really care about that man I killed? Ha. Huh. They would have done the same thing for the right amount of money. So when they come, I'll give them a few thousand dollars and tell them there's more where that came from. And then, once I've gained their trust, uh. I'll eliminate them. What are you talking about? You gonna shoot them too? Oh, no. Too crude, too messy. There are other ways, less detectable ways. Oh, God. I need a drink. I need to relax. I have the cure for what ails you, brother. A little surprise. Uh, I ain't no mood for no surprises. Well, I, I think you'll enjoy this one. Now, now sit here. Make yourself comfortable. I made a, a small adjustment on the lobometer while you were gone. What? What kind of adjustment? Well, you see, before, the lobometer only transmitted words and numbers to the brain. Yeah. But now, it can actually transmit images. Yeah. You see, your brain has a section that's called, uh, well, for lack of a better phrase, we'll call it the dream center. Okay. By centering on that specific part of your brain, the dream center, yeah. you can experience images uh, like a dream. For instance, I can type the words rainstorm on the keyboard, and you would see, feel, even smell rain like it was really there. Yeah. Here. Here. Here, yeah. put on the helmet, and I'll show you. It, it ain't some kind of trick, is it? Trust me, brother. Here you go. Put it on. Now, we'll just turn it on. There we go. Ah, I hate when you turn that thing on. That jolt of my brain. Now then, tell me, brother... Where would you like to be right now? Yeah. Pick any place in the world. Uh, well, uh, I don't know. How about one of them uh, tropical islands with uh, the palm trees and all that crap? One tropical island coming up. Now, let's see. Blue sky, yeah. sand, ocean, palm trees. Yeah. Enter. Yeah. Hey. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, hey, I see it. It's like, it's like I'm really there. I, c I can even feel the sand under my feet. Mm -hmm. hey, any danger around here? Oh, you want a female companion, do you? All right. Let's see, blonde hair, tan, measurements. There you are. Yeah. Well, yeah. hello, handsome. Hey, little lady. Come here often. <laughs> Uh-oh. Uh, there's trouble, brother. The girl is turning into a giant, man-eating lizard. Huh? <laughs> 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 Get away from me! Get away from me! Suddenly, suddenly, a, a, a jet flies by and drops a, a big bomb on the both of you. A bomb? Get me out of here! Get me out of here! Oh, oh no! Oh no, brother! Look out! Look out! I heard a wild animal stamping straight towards you. Here they come! What am I gonna do? Oh my god! Wait, wait, wait brother. Yeah. The animals. What? They're changing. They're changing what? into what? Into what? Bees! Yeah. No, no, not bees! Not bees! No! Yes, yes, they're bees. They're African killer bees. 
all around you. Us. And they're stinging you, brother. Go. Stinging your face. Ah. Stinging you in places you never knew you had. Ah. Stinging your entire body. Ah. Oh, now they're in your brain now, brother. Ah. They're stinging your brain. I hear There's no it. escape, brother. There's no escape from the stinging bees. Ah. Ah, what am I gonna do? I gotta get out of here! Brother. I gotta get out of here! I gotta get out of here! Ah! Jump, jump through the window, brother! Ah! Jump through the window! The it's wind. the only way! The window! Ah! Sorry, brother. I'm very sorry. Rest in peace. Open up, Bruno. We know you're in there. Open up. The door is open. There he is. And there's the bump that killed the boss. You want me to break his neck, red face, Charlie? Hold up, Knuckles. Hey, hey, you bummy. Hey, wh- wh- where's Bruno at, huh? He was very frightened that you were going to come and kill him, so he committed suicide. He jumped out of the window. Yeah, yeah, look. Look, there he is down on the street. He did jump out. Yeah. Holy moly. You look at all that money there on the table. Where did all that come from, eh? Oh, I thought you would see the money sooner or later. There's plenty more where that came from. How would uh, you two like to be my partner? Yeah. Work for a bum like you after you killed the boss? Hey, let's face it, Rat Face. The boss was a bum, too. Yeah. And I like to look at that money. Okay, say, say we did join up with you, eh? Well, what would we have to do? Oh, it's uh, very, very simple. All I would need is your uh, brain. Story for the computer age. <laughs> Personally, I-, I prefer to leave modern technology in the hands of those who know how to use it. <laughs> Besides, a damp morgue is no place for electronic equipment. And now, I'm afraid I must go. I have to poison the maggots. <laughs> That's a full day's job. Uh, but please, uh, do return for another story, won't you? Until next time, pleasant dreams. just heard Chet Cheddar's Tales from the Morgue. Today's installment, Interface to Terror. For correspondence, send to P.O. Box 252, Mejia, M-E-X-I-A, Texas 76667. The names and characters portrayed in this production are fictitious. Any similarities with actual persons, living or dead, is purely coincidental. A production by M and J Audio Theater. Sometimes you feel a bit nutty, especially if you're a weirdo. If that feeling transfers to your taste buds as well, I've got some great news for you. Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy Coffee. Wrap your taste buds around this medium dark roast blend with shrouds of almond, honey, and chocolate. Each bag of Nutty Mummy is exclusive to Weird Darkness and is roasted to order, then bandaged, I mean bagged, specifically for you to ensure maximum freshness for you, your mummy, and anyone else you share it with. Entomb your old coffee and bring your taste buds back from the dead with Weird Dark Roast Nutty Mummy at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee.
Are you willing to undertake a dangerous mission behind the enemy lines, knowing you may never return alive? What you have just heard is the question asked during the war to agents of the OSS, ordinary citizens who to this question answered, yes. This is Cloak and Dagger. Black Warfare. Espionage, international intrigue. These are the weapons of the OSS. Today's story, The People in the Forest, is suggested by actual incidents recorded in the Washington files of the Office of Strategic Services. A story that can now be told. The plane began to slow down, and then it circled slowly. Someone pulled the cover off the jump hole, and I got my first view of France. Occupied France. August, 1944. Action stations. On the ground to the right, I could see fires, like safety matches lit in the moonlight. And I wondered how big they really were, those fires that were out there to guide us in. The dispatcher told me I was to jump second. Running in. Ready, number one? Ready. And then it happened. The first bad break of that mission. Only it didn't happen to me, it happened to Chris Fowler. See you in France, Capella! Okay, Fowler. Number one. Good luck. Go! Geronimo! I just stood there, looking down, watching him go. And then my heart started to pound all over me. My breath caught, and I nearly choked on it. Chris fell and fell and fell... The chute didn't work. It came out of the bag and streamed unopened behind him. Paratroopers call that a Roman candle. Tough break. Want to turn back, Scarpella? Huh? No. No, I'll jump it. Okay, then. Ready, number two? Number two. Ready? Ready? Jump! The wind came up and hit me in a rush. I felt myself falling. I think I died a few times until I heard the crack of the chute. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. The most beautiful sight in the whole world, that big white umbrella over me. The little safety matches on the ground got bigger and bigger. I realized they were torches. And then I saw a figure of a man waving. He started to get bigger, too. And then the torches were put out. I was about to get my first introduction to the French underground. Are you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. I saw what happened to your friend. It was too bad. Yeah. You had courage to jump after that. Maybe if I'd stopped to think about it, I never would have. Maybe I was afraid I'd... Never jump again if I didn't then. Well, anyway, here I am. My name is Captain Robert Scarpella. Captain Robert Scarpella. American. Welcome. Welcome to France. I'm ecstatic to make your acquaintance, Captain. The little guy (laughs) threw his arms around me and kissed me. When I was 12, I'd said Nix to kissing my father goodnight because it embarrassed me. And here was this little Frenchman with the beret and baggy pants and farmer's shoes with his arms around me. <laughs> hey, cut it off, will I'm you? I'm just so happy to see you, Barry. <laughs> well, I'm the Fox. The Germans themselves gave me that name. Look at this head. Would you believe there is a price on it? Oh, uh, are you the leader? Yes, of one of our little bands. The British radio alerted us about your coming. Well, there's a good reason for my coming, Captain Fox. You may call me simply Fox. Okay, Fox. Well, all right. Now let's pick up supplies that were brought to you. Right. As for your mission, Captain, there will be time enough to, t- to talk about it when we get deeper into the forest to our highway. Uh, is it very far from here? Unfortunately, there's a little walk. We were forced to move our headquarters last night after another German raid. Oh? What do you mean, another? Our positions have been raided three times the past month, almost as if the Bosch were given a map of where we were in the forest. Oh? 
Sounds to me like somebody's dirty work. I have thought of that, Captain. But if there is a traitor in our group, I shall find him. We know how to deal with such. <laughs> I'll bet you do. Oh, here we are. Oh, <laughs> That's nice. Very, very, very nice. <laughs> this Karn rifle. Beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Now, there are shoes in those packages, too, and food and grenades. Oh, what a beautiful rifle. Uh, I was to tell you to expect a heavy supply drop in a few weeks. Oh, what a beautiful rifle. We still are using field pieces from the Franco-Prussian War. But this is a beauty. <laughs> now gather up your things, Captain Scarpella. I'll be back in a few minutes. I'll be back. The fox disappeared into the woods. The whole thing seemed like a crazy nightmare. The whole forest surrounded by Germans. And yet here I was passing the time of day just like nothing at all with a Frenchman who had a price on his head. And somewhere out there where he drifted, Chris was a dead heap under a lot of parachute silk. I grabbed the gun and I waited for trouble. I didn't know whether to go after the fox and take a chance on being ambushed to stay where I was. Someone was coming. I ducked behind a tree. The only thing I could figure was the Germans had seen the plane, seen me land. I took aim. Carefully. Slowly. American. American, where are you? Oh, for crying out loud, what happened? What were those shots? <laughs> I just wanted to get the feel of your gun. So I simply tried it on a couple of Germans over the edge of the hill. <laughs> it sights very well, though. <laughs> oh, crying out loud. This little dinner party is in your honor, Captain Scarpella. Oh? I regret we have nothing better than wild rabbits to offer you. Well, it's a swell. Quite a welcome. Headquarters didn't tell me to expect anything like this. <laughs> Luzette, more wine for the captain. But of course. Here, I will refill your glass. Oh, thank you. Oh, mais non. In France, we say thank you. This way. Hey. <laughs> You mind my kissing you? Oh, no, no, not at all. I love Americans. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. All Americans. Uh, hey. Come help me, I need your help. <laughs> Lucette, let's go. <laughs> Marie's calling you. Oh, oui, maman, I am coming. <laughs> uh, she's a very pretty girl, that... Uh, Lucette, uh, Lucette, Lucette. <laughs> yeah. And very young. Yeah. Only 17. Oh? Already she has seen so much. Hiding like this in the forest, sneaking back into the German-held village. Into the village? Oui, monsieur. Many of our group work in the village, right under the noses of the enemy. And the Germans do not know that they are members of the Maquis. Oh, but they know you're here. Oh, they know, they know that we're here, but they do not dare come near the forest, except in big raiding parties. Uh -huh. <laughs> they know very well that to one dead of ours, there will be twelve dead of theirs. Well, Captain, now about your mission. Its purpose? Tell me more, please. Well, I was sent here to find out the German defense plans for the port of San Nazaire and the entire coastal area around here. Ah. Now, I know those plans are in German headquarters in the village. And you request our help? I've got to have those plans, and in a matter of days. I've got to deliver them personally to 8th Corps headquarters. Now, put your mind at ease, Captain Scarpella. The fox will help you. <laughs> now, the first thing I will do is put you in contact... Attention! Attention! Captain Scarpella, I'm Marie. Ah, Marie. Marie. She's the mother cat of that little kitten who kissed you before. <laughs> oh, well, I'm happy to meet you. And we are all enchanted to meet you, American. In your honor, we have a special surprise. Listen. Attention. Uh, uh, Un, <clears throat> deux, trois. Oh, take me out to the ball again. Well, <laughs> For crying out loud. <laughs> You're pleased, Captain Scarpella. Well, this is something to write home about. Write home about? Yeah. Yeah, a nice, cozy evening with friends. Oh, you'd never know there was a war going on. Where's the lookout? There are two separate trucks about a kilometer from here, Captain Fox. I see, I see. What else? There are two divisions at least of German soldiers oh, surrounding us. Captain Scarpella, I regret very much to have interrupted your welcome party in this manner. 
René? Oui, le fox. René? Oui. Uh, the new machine our American friend brought with him. Oui. Now, what is it called, Captain Scarpella? A bazooka. Oh, yes, this b- 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 bazooka. bazooka. Now, take, his, take it to an advantageous position. You understand? Oh, we fuck. Now, listen. Yes, now, my friend, my friend. Now is the best time for him and some of the others to learn how to use it. Oh, for crying out loud. If I thought it seemed like a nightmare before, it was nothing to what happened now. It's so mixed up in my mind, I can't remember it clearly. It wasn't anything like the patrols I'd been trained for in the army. Now, Captain Scarpella, follow me, please. All right. Ah. (laughs) These Germans are becoming very annoying. Uh, Would you mind pointing that the other way, Fox? Yes, yes, excuse me. (laughs) (laughs) This bazooka is a beauty. Just a little beauty. From out of nowhere, a German soldier fell forward on his face. And then the fox and I moved on. I remember thinking, cripes, this is like kids playing cops and robbers. French boys, still in their teens, ran by with a cross of Lorraine sewn on their coats. I saw Marie take aim behind a tree. And all the time, the fox kept smiling. He never stopped smiling. (laughs) I feel selfish, Captain Scarpella. Give me that gun. I will let you borrow yours a while. They are about 50 yards ahead. There is a juicy rabbit in German uniform. Oh? Please, get him. (laughs) Captain LaFox was right. The rifle did sight well. And then all of a sudden there were less Frenchmen around and more Germans all around us. In a case like this, my friend, the best course is to run. Well, let us run. This forest is like a jigsaw puzzle to me. You know it backwards. It is from necessity, of course. I regret exceedingly that I must ask you to join me here in this swamp. We will stay here till it is safe to leave. Shh, shh, the boss. Under the water, all right? Leave only your nose above it to breathe. Oh, these are all the toilets. They are ghosts. How can one fight what one cannot see? I think we have in this time, Herr Hoffman. They are scattered and disorganized. Uh-huh. Perhaps this is the end of our trouble with them. Relaxed. They have retreated. But those arrogant devils may return again. Well, we'll find out from our informant later how good a job we have done this time. Yeah. I'm going up ahead. Shall I stay here as guard? Mm, no. It does not necessary. There's nothing here. Come better with me. Yeah, here, Hoffman. If they had posted a guard here, it would have been most inconvenient, Captain Scarpella. Are you very wet? Uh, what do you think? Well... There will be clean clothes for you at our hideout. Come. It is time for us to go there. Well, this has been a very annoying evening, Fox. (laughs) Fox, did you hear what they said about... uh... An informant. I heard. I heard. Captain Scarpella, Marie is employed as charwoman in German headquarters in the village. She is the contact of whom I spoke. Uh-huh. What can I do to help you? Just tell me. There are plans for the defense of San Nazar. What do you think the chances are that they may be in the files of the office where you work, Marie? Very good, I would say. Uh, Marie, Marie, tell me, what are my chances of getting into those files? Also very good. Mm-hmm. The door of the Hauptmann's office is left open for me, so I may wash the floors. I see. It will be easy to enter. As for the files, I have a key. A key? Wait. I will give it to you. Well, this is better than I hoped for. When can we go tomorrow? Tomorrow? Why not now? The Germans are still out searching the forest, and the coast will be clear. Let us leave now. Well, for... I'll say it for you, Captain Scarpella. For crying out loud. <laughs> Le 
Less than an hour later, we were in the village. It was five o'clock in the morning. And there was no one around. The village slept. Captain Scarpella, listen to me. Yeah. There is the German headquarters across the street. Mm -hmm. I will leave you and go inside to get my mop and bucket. You will watch through the window. Right. When I distract the guard, go quickly to the side door. It is open. Uh -huh. The Hauptmann's office is the third door from the end. The third, huh? You have the key to the, to the files, huh? Yes, 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 I have it. Bo, I go now. Remember the signal I give you in case of danger. I watched her go into the building. And then I took up my position at the open window. There was a guard at the front desk. No one else around. I pressed myself into the shadows. And after a while, Marie came to the front desk and began to mop the floor. How are you doing here, Charlie? I'm not that early, Sergeant. And the sooner I finish, the sooner I am through. How go about your business, sir? I knew that soon she'd do I something to distract her. You're disturbing me. <laughs> this, this too must, must be washed, no? I will be through presently. Ah! Find it! Oh, you spilled that all over uh, my boots. No. I'm so sorry. It was not deliberate. All over my boots. Look at the mess. The side door was open and she said it would be. Try for this. One, oh, please, two, please, three. The third door from the end. Start over the other end of the room. Right there. I made it. The German captain's office. And in the corner were the files. The key in my hand was hot and sticky. It fit. It fit. The key fit. I knew it would, but somehow it went slid in and turned. I took a breath of relief. I didn't have much time. I knew it didn't have much time. I had to find those plans, but where? The papers, where were they? And I heard Marie's signal. And I froze. What a break. But I couldn't stop searching now. Where are they? I only meant that. Almost as if God had put it into my hand at the right moment, I found the photostatic copies of the defense plans. And now, if she could only hold them off until I got out of the place. Let's see now, let's see. The window, that's it. It was only a short drop to the ground and still no one in sight. I had a feeling Marie could take care of herself and I started back for the forest, the plans in my pocket. Now, see here, Captain Scarpella. I'm the man, mm -hmm. you see? You come out of the forest three miles north at this point. Right. Is that uh, a clear road, Fox? You will have no difficulty, Captain. There has never been any reason for the Bosch to post guards at this exit. Mm -hmm. Now, pay attention, Captain. Yeah. I must talk to you, both of you. Marie, what are you doing back at the farmhouse? Why are you not in the village? Marie, was there trouble after I left through that window? Do they, do they know about the papers? They know, because they were told... Told by a dirty little spy from our own ranks. What? Now, please, quiet. This is my business, Captain. Speak, Marie. I overheard the spy. One of us. I blush with shame to think of it. The spy was telling the bush captain about the papers and the American's mission. Fortunately for you, Captain Scarpella, the spy was not able to warn him early go on, enough. Go on, go on, Marie. Go on. The road is blocked, however. You are trapped here, American. You may have the plans... But there is no way for you to leave and deliver them. The road north is swarming with red ants of Germans. The traitor. His name. Give me his name, Marie. I will do better. I will give you the traitor. René, bring her in here. No, no, please, please. Throw her on the floor. On the floor. Get me the ones. I said throw her on the floor. No. Listen to her sob, my own daughter, torn from my own flesh. For I, daughter, not for what is going to be done to you, but for what you have done, spy, traitor. This girl, my daughter, I spit on her. I did not know. I, I waited did not for her outside. What I was doing. After I, I heard her with her captain, her German captain, I waited for her and, and dragged her back here. Fox, do what you want with her. No, that. No, no. Lozette, look at me. No, no. Was it you? You who gave away our positions each time? Ha, 
casa. Yes, yes, I told them. It has been so hard. I have known war for so long now. All my life, it seems. I have known two wars. Would I turn on my own? I'm glad your your father is dead. So he does not see this. They promised me so much. I did not think it so bad. I, I only gave them small bits of information. Small bits of information? <laughs> Except for this last about the American. You call giving away our hideout small, loser? We are so much smarter than they. <laughs> and, and, and it always gave us a chance to kill so many oh, of them. <laughs> your excuses disgust me. Say the word, Fox. Let me throw her to the rest. No, no, Mama. Pity, a pity. I am, I am your mother no longer. Do not call me that. Now, wait a minute. Listen to me. Fox, this may be your affair, but I've got a stake in it. Now, what do you wish to say, Captain? There's only one way out of this forest. It's blocked right now. Thanks to her. Now, let's forget that. All that matters to me is that I get through with these plans. Now, Lizette. Lizette, do you want a chance to prove yourself? Oh, we, oui, we, oui, I will do anything. Do not listen to her, Marie, Captain. Marie, Marie. Two faces she has. Now, quiet. Go on, Captain. Now, at German headquarters before, Marie distracted the guard because she knew him. Now, who knows the Germans at the exit to the forest to distract them? I do. I will. Let me, please. They trust me. I will give you a chance to slip by. It is too great a risk, my friend. I have no choice. I can't stay trapped here. The plans are no good in my pocket. Very well. On one condition. I will go alone. And if she does not do as she says, the fox will shoot her through the heart. You have my permission. Ah. <laughs> there are many clouds out tonight to hide the moon. Well, the darker the better. Lucette, there are your friends at the foot of the hill. Go to them. We will hide here among these piles of firewood. We, oui. we, oui, I will go. And remember, Lucette, this gun is aimed at you. Go. We hid behind towering cords of tree trunks and branches piled in the woodlot for the village's firewood. We watched. A few minutes later, we saw them. The soldiers and the girl silhouetted against the moon. <laughs> We couldn't hear what they were saying, but every once in a while we heard them laugh. They swarm about her like bees about a flower. Come this way. We will sneak past them and into the brush. Quiet now. She's doing a good job trying to redeem herself. Shh. That stupid American. It's completely black with no way. Uh, you are a sly one, Lucette. You will say a clue. It's time to do the help of the don't make a mistake yeah, with yeah. you, no? <laughs> there are advantages to being an officer, eh? Yeah. <laughs> hey, where's Oh, we're caught. He's still on now, I can run! Captain, this way, into the brush. Help! Get back, Lucette! Oh, no. Get back, let go of the car! I looked back over my shoulder and saw Lizette crumple into a heap on the road. I knew she was dead. Do not grieve for her, my friend. It is best this way. It is easier than living with herself. How do we get out of this? We're surrounded. You're surrounded, American. Surrender. Surrender. What means that word? We know you're in debt. We would not. We have you cornered. Come out. Perhaps this will help you, Mincho. Hopper, over there. Step out of the bush. Come on, you do the same. They're trying to burn us out. If we come out, we'll be shot down by the machine guns. American, I have an idea. Yeah. Stand here. Mm -hmm. When you hear a loud crash and I call out, you run through the fire. It is not bad yet, my friend. He ran like the fox of his nickname to the tallest pile of firewood. In the dark night, I saw him struggle with a log at the base of the pile, and then the huge tower of wood came tumbling down and screamed. Ah! I plunged through the fire and found the path. And a few minutes later, the sly fox miraculously joined me. You can make it from here alone to the American lines, Captain Scarpelli. 
What about you, Fox? Ah, don't worry about it, Fox. I'll get back all right. Perhaps we shall meet again one day, Captain. Who knows? Well, au revoir, then. Goodbye. I never looked back. And I never saw him again. But when I think of him now... I think of him not with a beret... but with a green hat and a feather. A little like Robin Hood. Captain Scarpella delivered the plans personally... to the assistant G2 at 8th Corps Headquarters. And he was recommended for the Distinguished Service Cross for the American lives he had saved at the port of Saint-Nazaire. Thus, the exploits of another OSS agent closes with the words... Mission accomplished. A further adventure in black warfare is next week's... Cloak and Dagger. in today's Cloak and Dagger adventure were Joseph Buloff, Lily Darvas, Larry Haynes, Nancy Franklin, Barry Kroger, Raymond Edward Johnson, Carl Weber, Boris Applin, and Jerry Jarrett. Script for Cloak and Dagger was written by Winifred Wolfe, and the music was under the direction of John Gart. Today's true OSS adventure was based on the book Cloak and Dagger, by Corey Ford and Alistair McBain. This has been a Lewis G. Cowan production in association with Alfred Hollander. It was under the direction and supervision of Sherman Marks. Robert Warren speaking. Urban legends are thought by most to be tall tales passed down through the ages. Some of the stories are obviously make-believe, while others, as strange as they may seem, have their origins in actual events. Do alligators roam the dark tunnels deep beneath New York City? Do boogeymen who terrorize those afraid of the night really exist? Are killer clowns a myth born from our fear of the unknown, or could such evil truly walk among us? These are just a few of the urban legends that are explored in this book. After hearing some of the history for yourself, maybe you will be able to answer the age-old question, could it be true? Could It Be True, Volume 1, Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter, narrated by Weird Darkness host Darren Marlar. Hear a free sample on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. about this world of ours, and ever in search of the finest of its kind, we bring you the tops in Spine Chillers. The Creaking Door. Manufacturers of State Express 35 Filter King cigarettes take pleasure in presenting 
The Creaking Door. Good evening, friends of the creaking door. The creaking door is opening. So do come in. Why are you hesitating? Oh, I see. That apparition you met in your nightmare. Oh, yes. Is he here all right? Ready to drive you out of your mind. <laughs> Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3-5 today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3-5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3 fives today. A young, determined looking man steps out of his car onto the muddy dirt road and faces the bleak stone house at the end of the driveway. Hesitating a moment, he turns up his collar against the wind, then walks the long path to the forbidding door. Keeping me up. Oh, you better write the post. I'm coming in whether you like it or not. What are you doing here? What am I doing? You can ask that. Uh, no point in arguing. Come on in. We'll talk in the library. How did you uh, find this place? It wasn't easy. You saw to that, didn't you? In here. You want this, Carl? Oh. All right, Martha. An unexpected visit. You uh, know my wife, Martha, don't you, Alan? Pick some on a drink, Martha. Sit down. We'll talk. I didn't come all the way out here to make conversation. Uh-huh. What have you come for, then? What have you done with Julia? Clear the drinks, Carl. Alan? I've asked you what you've done with... Well, sir, perhaps Alan would prefer brandy to this. I prefer nothing. Carl. You shouldn't have done that, Alan. Those glasses are family heirlooms. Very difficult to replace. What have you two done with Julia? What have we done? Am I my sister's keeper? I know she's here someplace in this house. Don't try to tell me she isn't. I really wouldn't try to tell you anything in your present condition. Where is she? Upstairs? No, Alan. Upstairs, Mrs. Manning? I... Julia isn't here. What's got into you anyway? It's got into me. You made a good try, but it won't work. Julia and I are getting married. No matter what you do or try. That is your own personal business and Julia's. All I can do is to assure you that my sister isn't here. And you have no idea where she is? No. And that's what you'll tell me next. Uh, as a matter of fact, you're right. My wife and I needed a rest. We moved from town and rented this house. Not according to the age. That's ridiculous. He told me Julia's name is on the lease. I'm afraid, Alan, you've been misinformed. I'm going upstairs to look. Carl! It's all right, Martha. Let him go. And when I find her, Julia's leaving his house with me. Carl. Carl, he'll find her now. I know. He'll see what she's become. <laughs> yes, Martha. Alan's in for the shock of his life. But there's nothing we can do about it now. Julia? Julia, are you in here? Julia! Please leave, Alan. Please. 
Julia. What's the matter? Just do as I ask. Please leave. No. Why is it so dark? Don't turn that lamp on. What? Don't touch that lamp. Keep your hands away from it. Julia. Oh, you won't turn it on, Alan. Promise you won't. All right. What has he done to you, Julia? He? Your brother, Carl. What have he and his wife done to you? They've done nothing. Don't you dare say one word against them. Oh, Alan. Why did you try to find me? Why? How can you ask such a thing? Just a month ago, we were to be married, and then you disappeared. You've got to leave here at once. Stop make believe you didn't find me. What? You've got to. No. I'm going to find out what this is all about. For your own good, Alan, go away. Please. Go away and never come back again. I'm not budging until you tell me why. Why do you sound so peculiar? Why do you want to remain in the dark? Alan, please go. Not until you can look me straight in the eye and tell me you want me to leave. Alan, don't turn on that lamp. I'm sorry, Julia, but... Don't, don't, don't touch it, Julia. Now get out of here. Get out or I'll kill you. Feeling any better now, Alan? Yes, but my face has stopped bleeding. The gash is where she clawed you, or rather deep. Clawed? Now, can you understand why I said my sister wasn't here? Carl, what's wrong with her? What is it? Alan, I know you don't like me, but please, take my advice. Forget you ever knew Julia. What? I know it sounds cruel, but it's the best advice I can offer you. I'm sorry, it's out of the question. All right. That leaves me no choice but to tell you. Perhaps, after all, it is better that I do. Tell what? What's wrong with Julia? I'll have to ask for your complete confidence. You have it? Look in the mirror, Alan. Huh? Look at those scratches on your face. Well? What are you driving at? Don't they seem strange to you? A moment ago, you used the term clawed. Y you said I was clawed. Exactly. Are those marks the marks the human hand would make? Or are they not more like the marks of an animal's claw? Y you're not making sense. The sensible explanation is not to my liking either, Alan. It wasn't easy for me to face it when I first saw the reversion setting in. Reversion? I, I don't follow you. It was semi-dark in the room upstairs, but still you noticed something very peculiar about Julia. Uh, physically, that is. Well, she was altogether peculiar. I mean something specific. Her eyes. What did you notice about her eyes? She kept her face pretty well away from me, but... Now you mention it. Yeah. I noticed her eyes were... Oh, God. <laughs> they did absurd. You noticed they were what, Alan? They were like... Uh, like the eyes of a cat. Uh, yes. In the last two weeks, the reversion process has been stepped up, I'm afraid. Already her pupils have expanded to the full iris, and perhaps you've noticed her fear... Or rather, her pathological hatred of light. Y yes, I did. Her fingers, their virtual claws now. Stop it, please. C can't something be done? A doctor? We've tried everything. If a doctor were to see her now, his only recommendation would be to put her in an institution for the rest of her life. Her unnatural life. Julia. I know how you feel. It's quite late, Alan. If, if you'd like, you may spend the night with us. Thank you. Father. Uh, Show you upstairs to your room. It, it, it's just not believable. I know. Too shocking to accept at first. <coughs> Carl! Now can you believe, Alan? Now can you believe every word that I've told you is true? <coughs> Julia. Carl. Julia, where have you been? Bean? I... I know. You promised me you wouldn't leave this room. I've been looking all over the house and grounds for you. Now, where were you? Oh, please don't be angry with me. Please. I'm not angry, but for your own sake, you must do as I say. If you don't, I'll have you'll to... send me away. No, Julia. I'll just have to keep the door to this room locked. Oh, you'll never send me away. You'll never do that. I promised you, didn't I? Now, come on. Lie down. Uh, uh, Carl... Alan was here tonight. I know. You let him see me. I couldn't help it. He insisted. You let him stay in the house. You'll go first thing in the morning. He came to take me away. You mustn't think about that now. I scratched him. I hated him. 
I didn't think I could ever hate Alan. I told you not to think about it. Everything's going to be all right. Will it? Will I ever get better? Of course, now look. Just lie back, Julia, and I'll stroke. I'll soothe your forehead. I, I didn't mean You to... were going to say stroke? No, I... I... You were, weren't you? Stroke? As you would a cat. No, Julia, I wasn't. You mustn't put words into my mouth. You'll only make things worse for yourself. What is it? Julia. Where were you tonight? No. Are you out of the house? I, I don't remember. You, Why? you were with someone. Try to remember. I can't. Why, Carl? Never mind. It's nothing. You're keeping something from me. No. You're hiding something behind you. You've got something in your hand. It's nothing, I tell you. Let me see what... Now, let go. Oh, 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 Julia. My clipper. My slippers covered with blood. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 35 today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders. And the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3-5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3-5's Well, well, well. They say a cat has nine lives. Poor Julia. I wonder how many she has left. <laughs> oh, Carl! Carl! Carl, look! Look at this. Hey, easy, Martha. I, I killed this room. The kind of breakfast was ready. I, I found him on the floor that way. His throat clawed open. You, you better get out of here. Carl, Carl, what happened? Don't come in, Julia. I heard my Julia. scream. Julia. Oh. Julia, you mustn't look. That's why there was blood on my slipper. That's why. Martha, help me get her out of here. I was with Alan last night and I killed him. She's insane. Julia really believes she's a cat now. Wasn't that our plan, Martha, to drive her out of her mind? It's gone too far. Not at all. It hasn't gone quite far enough yet. You'll howl like a cat again tonight. No, I won't. We've got to stop this right now. Oh, if she gets worse, she'll kill both of us. That'd be ridiculous. Julia couldn't kill anybody. But Alan... Julia didn't kill Alan. What? I killed Alan. You? Of course. It was quite necessary. Oh, why didn't you tell me? Why did you let I me... I wanted to get a legitimate performance out of you when you found his body. I wanted you to be horrified, and I wanted you to recoil from Julia just as you did... You're a murderer. That's a very unpleasant thing to say. I was merely protecting my investment of time and trouble. You didn't have to commit murder. Oh, but I did. You see, I hadn't really convinced Alan at all. How do you know? I kept my eye on his room after he went up to bed. I saw him steal out and come downstairs here. I listened on the upstairs extension. I heard him telephone Peterson. And the doctor told him what was wrong with Julia? He explained to Alan the symptoms of hermetolopia, day blindness. And you killed him for that? <laughs> of course. But why? You've suddenly turned very sensitive, darling. I never bargained for murder. When you want money, as much money as my sister Julia has, you must be prepared to take any step, no matter how violent. But what Carl... did you expect me to do? Allow Alan to tell Julia that she was suffering from an eye affliction after I built up in her mind that she was slowly turning into a cat? Or would you choose to allow him to walk out of here and go to the police? I, I don't want that money now. <laughs> You're just excited. 
You'll feel differently about it later. No, I'll never feel differently after what's happened. I told you all along I had a feeling something would happen. What could possibly happen now? Alan's out of the way. His body will never be found. I'm not thinking of Alan. I'm thinking of your sister. What about Julia? Oh, I'm thinking of the terrible thing we've done to her. It's a little late to think about that, isn't it? I don't know that. There must be something we can do. There's only one thing you're going to do, Martha, and that is, as I say... Carl, We're please. going to keep working on Julia until she's put away for the rest of her life. We're going to keep at it until I have every cent of hers. No, Julia, it was only a dream you had. It's a thing that... It's only a bad dream, that's all. I killed again, just like I killed Alan. No, you oh, didn't. Oh, God, I'd rather be dead than like No, this. Julia, please. I can't must... stop myself anymore. It'll get worse and worse. Look at my hands. They're not really hands anymore. They're claws. And... <gasps> what is it? I was out. No, it's just a dream, I told it you. It wasn't a bad dream. I did kill again. My dressing gown, look. Covered with blood. Julia. They'll find me now. This time they'll find me and put me away. I, I won't let that happen. I promised to take care of you, didn't I? Oh, yes, sir. And but... I will take care of you always. The very best I can. <laughs> When are you going to leave her alone? When she's beyond help completely, and only then, Mother. I, I can't stand it anymore. You'll stand as much as I say you can stand. Now get hold of yourself. Won't be much longer. No, Carl. It won't be much longer. What do you mean? You'd better stop now. I'm warning you. Warning me? For your own good. Don't be ridiculous. You won't listen to me. You won't stop. Of course not. The plan is perfect. Nothing could go wrong now. Julia? Not hungry. I want to talk to you. Why did you close the door, Martha? Since Alan died, you've never closed it while you were in here. You were afraid to be alone with me. I'm not afraid anymore. I'm here to help you. Help me? To get away from here. What? To get away from Carl. There isn't much time. I don't want to leave Carl. He's the only one who can help me now. No, Julia. I'm the only one who can really help you now. You must leave here tonight before it's too late. You're trying to trick me. No. Oh, believe me. You're jealous because Carl is good to me. You've always been jealous. Please listen. I'm only trying to help. If you stay here, you're lost. You'll end up in an institution. That's what Carl wants. That's what you want. You want me out of this house so they can get me and put me away. No, Julia. Oh, you must believe me. At first, I did want that. Carl talked me into it. But now... It... It's gone too far. Now I only want to save you from Carl. Julia, you're not a murderess. What? You didn't kill Alan. But I did. And the other people I killed. There were no other people. Only Alan. And you didn't kill him. Carl did. No. Carl wouldn't do that. He, he knew I loved Alan when I... When I was... Before this happened to me. Carl killed Alan. I swear it. I can't believe. You must. It's your only chance. Carl put the blood on your slipper and on your dressing gown. <sighs> it was all a trick to drive you out of your mind. And if you don't let me help you tonight, it'll be too late for you. They'll put me away? For the rest of your life. Well, Julia? You've helped me, Martha. Really? Yes, in every way I can. But what can you do now? I've planned it all. Tonight at dinner, I'll put a sedative in Carl's coffee. By nine, he'll be fast asleep. And I'll be waiting in the car for you. Do you understand? Yes, Martha. I understand. You'll be waiting for me downstairs in the car at nine o'clock. And by the time Carl wakes, you'll be hundreds of miles away from here. Safe. Mm -hmm. 
surprised to see me, Martha. I... According to your calculations, I should be fast asleep at this point. Isn't that right? I, I don't know what you mean. Don't waste time fencing. I replaced the sedative with a quite uh, innocuous powder. You... You overheard Julia and me? Not at all. I had no idea of your scheme until Julia told me. What? Julia told me everything. She didn't believe me. Not a word. She thought you were only trying to trick her. You see, Martha, it was only a waste of your time and your life. What? Your life. Carl. I can't trust you any longer. That's fairly obvious, isn't it? Carl, you, you wouldn't. I've no other course now. Oh, you couldn't kill me. I once told you when you want something badly enough, no step is too violent. <laughs> you see this, Martha? Oh. This is the iron claw that was used on Alan. Carl, no, please. After I'm finished, I'll call the police. I'll oh. tell them about my sister. Carl. My completely insane sister and the horrible thing she's done to my wife. No. And then I'll have everything I've worked for. Police, Sergeant Jackson speaking. Uh, this is Carl Manning. I, I, I live on Windmill Road, the last house in from the highway. Please come right away. Manning, Windmill Road. Yes. Got it. What's wrong? There's been a murder. Murder? Yes. My wife's been clawed to death. <laughs> uh, Julia. How did you get down here? I wasn't in my room when you lost it. Get upstairs immediately. No, Carl. I'm not going back to that room again. Ever. Julia, you'll do as I say or I... Oh. Why did you turn out the lights? I heard everything you said on the phone. What? And I saw what you did to Martha in the car. You, 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 you... I wanted you to do that to her. That's why I told you everything. And you did believe her. It made no difference. It was too late for me. Julia, I, I, I want those lights on. No, Carl, I like the dark. Remember, I can only see clearly in the dark. But you can't see me, can you? Julia, Julia now, listen to me. I can see in the dark because I'm a cat. No, no Julia, I... And you can't hear my step because I walk on cat feet. No, Julia, there's really nothing wrong with you. It's, it's just an eye affliction, that's all. It's more than that now. I'm more a cat than a human being now. <laughs> you bumped into the table because you can't see in the dark. You don't have cat's eyes like I have. You're, you're, you're not a cat, Julia. You're My not. My hands are claws now with no. sharp, long nails. Nails that can rip and tear and kill. No, it's only in your mind. You, you, you can't kill. I'm a cat, Carl. You made me one. You turned me into an animal. Julia, please, to turn on the light. You'll never see light again, Carl. Ever. Ah, 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 ah. Julia, I... You're cast up against the window ah. now. Behind you is the steep cliff. You're in a corner and you can't get up. You're a mouse trapped <laughs> in a corner by a cat. Julia, stand back, don't. A mouse trapped by a cat. Oh, oh, oh.
You can never tell when one of them will turn up to be a relative of yours. <laughs> the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5 today. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. It's a blend that has been perfected after years of constant research by our master blenders and the recent development of an entirely new process which gives you an even smoother 3.5 smoke. We promise you, it's the smoothest cigarette you can get. Move in world class. Get the taste of new smooth State Express 3.5s today. This is your host back again. Just a reminder of our rendezvous next week. Where are we going? Through the creaking door, of course. <laughs> the manufacturers of State Express 3-5's Filter King cigarettes invite you to listen next Saturday at 9 o'clock when they will again present... The Creaking Door. So far on my low-carb journey, I've lost over 50 pounds. Everybody's different, but it appears slashing the number of carbs I consume has had the biggest impact for me. And discovering Built Bars has made the journey a lot easier by replacing my high-carb, high-sugar desserts with something that still tastes like a candy bar, but only has 150 calories, is low-carb, and is packed with protein. If I'm craving a late-night snack, instead of heading to the fridge or pantry for something I know isn't good for me, I just grab a Built Bar. I've used Built Bars as breakfast on a fairly regular basis, which not only keeps me from the unhealthy fast food, but means I also don't waste money on those fast food places either. If low-carb is your life, try Built Bars. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built. Use the promo code WeirdDarkness, all one word, and get 10% off your entire purchase. WeirdDarkness.com slash built, promo code WeirdDarkness. We bring you Creeps by Night. Tonight, once again, we introduce the man who has agreed to serve as your guide and companion on these sometimes terrifying pilgrimages into the world beyond the realm of human understanding. The man who, for reasons that cannot be presently explained, must keep his identity a secret. Creeps by night brings you its anonymous master of mystery, Dr. X. Good evening. This is Dr. X. 
joining with you for further research into the shadowy darkness of the unexplored, the darkness of the human mind. I wish first, however, to thank you for your letters commenting on last week's broadcast, The Walking Dead. Many of you requested that I reveal my identity, and a few of you hazarded a guess as to who I am. In due time, perhaps, I will be able to step out from under my cloak of mystery. But for the present, I ask you to bear with me, since I shall have to be known only as Dr. X. Tonight, I have a rare treat in store for you. Mr. Edmund Gwen, the celebrated English actor, is our guest. The story I have chosen is drawn from the casebook of medical science and concerns itself with the often ghastly power of fear. Yes, we are all slaves to fear in one form or another. But the fear that forms the basis for our dramatization tonight is undoubtedly the most horrible of them all. It is the fear of... But wait. Let me draw aside the curtain and bring you Mr. Edmund Gwen as Ramsey in The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan. For more than a century, the old Jordan house has stood on a gentle slope, mistress of the surrounding 400 acres of birch woods and pasture lands. And now, inevitably, death seems near to the last of the strong men who have always owned it aged, irascible Alexander Jordan. In his faded, musty bedroom, the shades are drawn against the hot morning sun. And in the half-darkness, his pale, hollow cheeks blend into the color of the pillowcase. He stirs as the door opens and his doctor enters. That you, Rutledge? Yes. Come in and sit down. Close the door. What's the trouble, Alex? Had one of my cataleptic fits last night. A bad one. I'm going to die pretty soon, Rutledge. <laughs> Suppose you let me do the guessing. Don't well. interrupt. I'm not afraid to die, mind you. I've never told anyone this, but my greatest fear is that it won't be death. And they'll bury me alive. Oh, I think we can be pretty sure if it comes to that. Don't be so positive. Thirty-eight years ago, a young butcher who called himself a doctor pronounced me dead when I had a cataleptic fit. He got me buried, too, if I hadn't come out of it on time. That was thirty-eight years ago. Could happen again. Rutledge, I don't care if I sound like an old fool. All my life, that scared me. The idea of somebody mistaking one of those fits for death. The only nightmares I ever have, I wake up in a coffin... I put my hands up and I feel the lid there. Sometimes it's wood, sometimes it's cold glass. But there's no room to turn around. I put my hands down and I can feel the silk lining. They have me dressed in a swallowtail. They have a stiff collar on me. I reach up to tear it away. I can't breathe. I have to have air. Panic grips me. I try to shout, but no one can hear me. I beat on the coffin lid with my fists. I try to break the glass, but I can't do it. I haven't enough room. And pretty soon I know that I'm dying. Really dying. In the cold horror of the grave. Because somebody mistook one of my cataleptic fits for death. I don't want that to happen, Rutledge. And that's why I called you. Oh, you're just getting worked up over nothing, Alex. So listen to me. When the day comes and my nephew, Ramsey, or his wife, Martha, calls you, I want nobody but you to come, Rutledge. I don't want any other doctor to pronounce me dead. Is that clear? Don't worry. I want you to go over me very carefully. If you are absolutely satisfied that I'm dead, you can go ahead with the funeral. But I don't want my body embalmed. I don't want anything done to me except to put me in a coffin. And... Getting a lawyer here to write all this down this afternoon, Rutledge. But I wanted you to hear it, too. I want my coffin put in the vault down by the birch woods. That's why I built the vault right on this property, so that nobody would ever bury me underground. All right. It'll be done just as you say. Now, wait a minute. I'm not finished. This is the most important part. 
I want a large brass bell placed on the wall over the bed where Ramsay and Martha sleep. I want wires connected from that bell to the vault. Electric wires. What for? I want a push button attached to the ends of those wires, and I want the button placed in my hands as I lie in the coffin, so that in case I'm not dead, in case I awaken, I can ring the bell and let them know. Well, I must say, Alex... I don't care what you say. I don't care what anyone says. That's the way I want it. All right, Alex. That's the way you'll get it. Ah, make sure I do. Well, I've got to run over to the Pritchards. Nor is having another baby. Taking that digitalis faithfully? Yeah. Foolishness. But I'm taking sure, it. That's good. Goodbye, Alex. Get out and soak up some of that sunshine. I'll see you Thursday. Send Martha in. Long. All right. Just a minute there. Dr. Rutledge? Oh. Hello, Ramsey. I'd like to know why you came this morning, Doctor. I came because I was sent for. Why doesn't somebody tell me when the doctor's been sent for? Is my uncle all right? He's not dead, if that's what you want to know. Not quite yet. Mm -hmm. See that he keeps on taking that prescription I left. He wants to see your wife. Alone. Martha? You heard me. Goodbye, Ramsey. I know the way out without your help. Goodbye, Dr. Rutledge. Mother, wipe your hands. He wants to see you. What did you say, dear? I said wipe your hands. He wants to see you. Is the doctor still in there? Is he all right? The doctor's gone. He wants you in there. Alone. Oh, for goodness sake. Now what? Just a minute. Why is he asking to see you? Alone. Why, Ramsey? How should I know? Something's up. Rutledge was in there a long time. Why wasn't I told he was sent for? Why, he... Well, you were in the fields this morning when he asked me to call the doctor. Next time you tell me when he sends for people. And listen, when you get in there, watch what you say. Why, Ramsey, I don't know what you mean. You know very well what I mean. Just listen. And don't babble. He mightn't like my ideas about what to do with this place after he's dead. Go on in there now. You've already wiped your hands six times. Yes, Ramsey, dear. You want me, Uncle Alex? Yes, come in and shut the door, Martha. Yes, Uncle Alex. Was the coffee all right this morning? Yes, fine. Miss Ramsey. He's, uh, he's in the kitchen. Sit down, Martha. Yes, Uncle Alex. I want to talk to you, Martha. Lawyer Gaines will be here sometime this afternoon to fix up my will. Oh, Uncle Alex. I've got a feeling my time is drawing near, Martha. And I just want to make sure that worthless nephew of mine doesn't get his hands on the Jordan place. I never made you marry him, Martha. I, I, I... Ah, never mind. None of my business. But I could have told you he was no good. Never has been. I wouldn't trust him with the farm. He'd sell it before my body turned cold. But I trust you, Martha. Thank you, Uncle Alex. Yes, I've thought it all over. I'm going to leave the place to you. At least you'll have a roof over your head and some land you can call your own. You like it here, don't you? Oh, yes, I do. I'd be perfectly happy to stay here the rest of my life. Well, that's fine, because it's going to be yours, all of it. Oh, Uncle Al, you make me want to cry. No, no, none of that. I'm sorry. There's one more thing, Martha. One important thing. Yes? Uncle Alley. I've given Dr. Rutledge some very careful instructions about my burial. Oh, please, Uncle Alley. Nothing to be afraid of, Martha. When it comes, it'll come, and that's all. Rutledge knows what to do. He'll tell you. And I want you to promise me that you'll follow the instructions. Yes, of course, Uncle Alex. On my word of honor. As God is my witness. Thank you, Martha. 
Well, by Jove, you've made me feel a good deal better knowing I have someone around I can trust. Matter of fact, I think I'll get up for supper tonight. Tell Ramsey to come in and help me dress after Lawyer Gaines leaves. Tell him I don't want him in here before then. Yes, Uncle Alex. And uh, don't breathe a word about this to Ramsey. I won't. If you need anything, Uncle Alex, call me. Yes, I will. Oh, what did the old buzzard want? His lawyer's coming this afternoon. You're to go in and help him dress after the lawyer leaves. He's having supper at the table? Yes. Bring in one of the special hams. I'll bake it with pineapple. Did it take you ten minutes in there to decide on baked ham with pineapple for supper? What we decided is none of your business. What do you mean, what you decided? I said it was none of your business. Better get out and feed the chickens. When did you start giving me orders? Oh, go on out of my kitchen. I've got work to do. What did you talk about in there? Ramsey! You're hurting my arm. I'll hurt more than that before I'm through. What's the lawyer coming for? Would you like me to tell him you haven't fed chickens yet? Something suddenly made you awfully cocky, it seems to me. Tell me what it is. Right now. Ramsey! Tell me, I said. Ramsey! Let go of her, Ramsey! Oh! I was only... uh... Get out of the house before I lose my temper. Go on, get... I'm going. If this ever happens again, Martha... You let me know. Yes, Uncle Alex, but you shouldn't have gotten out of bed this way. Oh, don't worry about me, Martha. I'm all right. Bacon and eggs for his breakfast. And why not? Did you fix the fence post over on the west pasture? Never mind the fence post. Give me that tray. You tend to your own business. I'll take the tray into him. Your breakfast, Uncle Alec? Hmm. That's funny. Uncle Alex. Uncle Alex. Oh, my Lord. Ramsey. Oh, Dr. Rutledge. Ramsey. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he have everlasting life. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. What's the matter with Martha, Doctor? The funeral was evidently too much for her. I gave her a sedative and put her to bed upstairs. Where's the undertaker? Down at the vault with the electrician. They're waiting for you so we can close the coffin. Of all the stupid things, he's dead, isn't he? Yes, but we're observing his wishes to the letter. Brass bells and electric push buttons rot. Perhaps it is, but that's how he wanted it. And incidentally, as administrator of the estate... Let me remind you that according to the terms of the will, either you or Martha must remain within earshot of that bell upstairs for seven days. You understand that? Yes, to my life. I'm beholden to a woman. That. You could do worse, Ramsey. (laughs) This is a nice place. I wish it were mine. If I had my way, you could buy it in a minute. Well, that's neither here nor there. See that Martha gets some rest. I left a bottle of medicine on the small table beside the bed. She's to take it according to directions if she has trouble sleeping. Lord, what's that? Your uncle wanted a bell loud enough to be heard. He certainly got it. Doctor. The the undertaker or the electrician at the crypt touched the push button. Ramsey! Ramsey! Good Lord, I forgot. The bell sounded right above the bed where she was asleep. Come on. Oh, Ramsey! Dr. Rutledge, the bell! Oh, it doesn't mean anything, Martha. Don't be frightened. Oh, thank goodness. I was asleep. 
hit me like a blow when it rained. For a moment, I couldn't even move. I felt paralyzed like in a dream. There, there, that's all right. Go on back to bed. You fall asleep again with the stuff I gave you. The bell won't ring anymore. I'll go right on down to the vault and see if the coffin is closed. Get her back in the bed, Ramsey, and let her have another teaspoonful of that medicine tonight. You just get over to the vault and stop there monkeying. I'll tend to her. See that you do. And remember, don't leave this place for seven days. been able to get into town and get anything fresh, Ramsey, and you know it. It's just that you're nervous and not sleeping. I'll though. drive into town. No, Ramsey. We've still got five days to go. Four o'clock. Why can't I sleep? Why... Three nights of it now. Three nights with that bell hanging over my head. Oh. Martha, you asleep? It must be that stuff Rutledge gave her. I'll take some. I can't stand it any longer. Now, maybe... Maybe I'll sleep. I tell you, Martha, there's only one thing to do with the place. Sell it. You're wasting your time, Ramsey. I will not sell it. Oh. I'm not getting any younger. I want a roof over my head. That's what Uncle Alex intended. But now's the time to sell farms. We can get a good price. To begin with, Ramsey, it doesn't even belong to me. Well, it will in two more days, won't it? Yes. If that bell doesn't ring. Oh. Oh, I've got to sleep tonight. It's, it's the last night. Tomorrow the place is ours. I'll take some of that medicine that worked before. I won't sell the place, Annie. I won't sell. Talking in her sleep. I won't sell. She's dreaming. Having a nightmare. Too much of this dope, maybe. You must wake up. Not the... Gave must be powerful. Oh. That gives me an idea. No, trust you, then. No, dear. You won't have to trust me much longer, you dried up old fool. No. Let's have a look at the little bottle. Oh. I guess it's all right to turn the lamp on. She won't wake up. Oh. There. Now let's see what the label says. Maximum dose, one teaspoonful every 12 hours. Caution. Overdosing may be fatal. Overdosing may be fatal, eh? So with your mm, We'll see about that. <laughs> Maximum dose, one teaspoonful. I have to put three in her coffee tomorrow morning. She'd never know the difference. 
That stale coffee is bitter as gall anywhere, and that it fits everything. Yes, I'm her only relative. If she dies, I get the police. Oh, why didn't I think of this before? Why did I wait six days and nights with that bell hanging over my head? Why did I? Oh, good Lord. Am I dreaming? No, no. It can't be. It can't. Stop. Stop that ringing. Fancy. Fancy. The bell. I can hear it, you fool. Quick. Fancy. Stay where you are. I'll stop it. Fancy. What did you do? What do you think I did? The wires. You pulled out the wire. Get back in the bed. Are you out of your mind? The key to the vault. Where is it? What? The key. Uncle Alex must be You're alive. You're crazy. You rang the bell, didn't you? You were dreaming. Get back to bed. Give me that vault key, Randy. Give it to me. Now, take it easy. Don't stand there telling me to take it easy. Uncle Alex may be fighting for breath. Breathing against the coffin. Get the key. All right, all right. I'll go down there. I'll go with you. Doesn't need two people. Just let me get into my clothes. I don't trust you, Randy. You've got no right to say a thing like that, Martha. What difference does it make to me whether Alex is alive or dead? I don't stand again anything. He left the Jordan place to you. Oh, now where did I put that key? Must be in this drawer. Hurry, Randy. I'm hurrying. There, here it is. You took something else out of that drawer, Randy. I did not. Just the key. What's the matter with you anyway? Where are my shoes? Under the bed. I'll be watching you from the window, Randy. If Uncle Alex is alive, yell to me. And I'll phone Dr. Rutledge. There's a storm coming up. That wind's from the east. Now, let's see if this key fits. It's all right, but, but it won't turn. Ah, there we are. Now, where's that light switch? Here it is. Yeah, that's better. Whew. Oh, it's foul in here. It smells dead. There's the coffin. Hope they didn't screw down the lid. No. No, it comes right up. Yeah. He hasn't moved. He's dead. Yes, just the way he was when they put him in there. With his hands folded over the bow button. He didn't ring that bell. Who did? Oh, now I know. The storm. Lightning shorted the wire. Sure, that's what it was. It must have been. Still, I... I think I'd better make sure while I'm down here. Yes. Oh, Martha almost caught me taking this darning needle out of the drawer. Oh, I'll work it under his shirt and jab it through his heart. You're going to stay dead, Uncle Alex, no matter what happens. Sandy! Martha! You followed me. I told you I didn't trust you. What are you doing with that darning needle in your hand? Nothing. Get out of the way. Let me look at him. Dead. Stone dead. Who rang the bell? Well, how did I know? Maybe his ghost. You were about to do something with that needle. What? You really want to know? All right. I'll tell you. I was going to jab it through his black heart. I was going to make sure he was dead. And I'm still going to do it. Brandon, see, you're out of your mind. Am I? We'll see. Keep away from that coffin. Shut up. I'll scream, Randy. The questions will hear me. No, you won't. Yes, I will. Help! Help! Oh, so that's how it is. Wait till I close this door. Now, scream your lungs out. Randy, don't do anything you'll regret. Regret? Why waste this needle on old dead Alex? I might do much better using it on you. Just get into your heart. Randy! Why not? Then I get to own the place and sell it. Randy! Listen to me. I listen to you plenty these last few weeks. Ever since he made you the high and mighty boss. But now, it's my turn. Randy! I'll never find you down here. No! No, you'll dry up and rot. Just like he's rotting in that coffin. Randy! No! Randy! 
fainted before I could touch her. Wait a minute. That gives me an idea. There's a better way of doing it. Carry her up to the house. Pour that medicine down her throat. Give her an overdose. She'll be dead by morning. And no one can put it on me. Oh, oh this is beautiful. Everything's working out fine. You're going to be rich, man. Be rich. Get the door open first. And then... Lord. The key's on the outside. And it's a snap lock. No. No. Oh, what am I going to do? I'm locked in here. I can't get out. The door's solid open. Six inches thick. There are no windows. No air. Well, the push button's in his hands. I'll keep wearing it. Yes. Sooner or later, someone will hear it. Yeah. Yeah, this should do it. The Prestons or the MacArthur's, they're down to hear it and investigate. I'll keep bringing it all night. I'll... I'll... Oh, no wires. Wires in the bedroom. I ripped them out. The bell... won't ring. Look out! That was the strange burial of Alexander Jordan, starring Mr. Edmund Gwen. For our next exploration into the darkness of the human mind, I have invited the celebrated exponent of the Mysterioso, Peter Laura, to be our guest. So join with us when once again we raise the shadowy curtain of the unknown and look deep into the souls of men. Until then, this is your master of mystery, Dr. X, leaving you with creeps, by night. Creeps by Night is produced by Robert Maxwell. Original music composed by Paul Creston, conducted by Joseph Stopak. Supporting Mr. Gwen in tonight's presentation were Everett Sloan as Alexander Jordan, Abby Lewis as Martha, Gregory Morton as Dr. Rutledge, and Dr. X as himself. Edmund Gwen appeared to the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor, whose 20 year anniversary picture, The White Cliffs of Dover, is currently being released. George Gunn speaking. This is the Blue Network. If you like what you're hearing on Weird Darkness, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can find information on sponsors you heard during the show, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, find other podcasts that I host. You can visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. And if you have a true paranormal or creepy tale to tell of your own, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Good evening. This is Crime Classics. I am Thomas Highland with another true story of crime. Listen. That's a frigate cutting through the Caribbean. It's just before dawn and cloudless as the sky. The year is 1736, 
when the stars were younger than they are now and shone more brightly. And this particular sky of tropic brilliance was a navigator's dream. The land was close, and a trade wind bellied the mainsail and set the good frigate scudding. And daylight was just beyond the horizon. There, at the wheel, the helmsman, John Richardson. And holding his bottle for him was his small and drunken friend, Richard Coyle. The frigate sank in six minutes and drew sharks. The helmsman and his friend got away, only to commit other nuisances on the seven seas. So tonight, my report to you on Coyle and Richardson, why they hung in a spanking breeze. Crime Classics, a series of true crime stories from the records and newspapers of every land from every time. Your host each week, Mr. Thomas Highland, connoisseur of crime, student of violence, and teller of murders. Now, once again... Mr. Thomas Highland. They were making rum in Havana in 1736. The place went good with rum. It was hot. There were a lot of mosquitoes. And in every nook and cranny there were dark-eyed beauties... It was necessary to fortify oneself. Beside which, Havana was under almost continual attack by pirates and buccaneers, some of whom stayed over because of the rum. So the town was peopled mostly, beside the dark-eyed beauties, that is, by transient cutthroats, deserting sailors, runaway slaves, uncaught murderers, and, generally speaking, black-hearted knaves. All in all, a populace dedicated to Saturday night. One of the fellows who just had Saturday night and was lying in an alley was a deserting seaman named John Richardson. That's John for you. And here comes Dick. Dick Coyle, a little man who robbed drunken sailors. Here he comes. Such a big one you are, mate. So much of you unconscious. Now let's see what you got in your pockets to make a small one like me more comfortable. Ah, now here's a... Ah. Gotcha, little weasel. Let me go! Let me go! Little scurvy. Going through my pockets, were you? How you wanted, mate? Knife? Or just twist your neck? <laughs> <laughs> little sparrow. Think I will twist your head clean off. No, mate. No, mate, listen to me. At what? It's an important thing I got to tell you, mate. Ah. Uh... I swear. And something to give you, too, mate. Hey, now. Hey. What? Ain't you, uh, ain't you? I'm John Richardson. What John are... Richardson. John. Old John. Big John. How be you, John? What weaseling you doing, mister, to keep me from killing you? Now, why should you be killing me? For stealing my pockets dry. I was leaning close over you to see if you be Big John Richardson. Because I got this for you. What? This watch. This watch I'm holding up for you. See how it spins, John. See how pretty from a chain. Pretty. Gold. Pretty. And it's yours, Big John Richardson. Take it. Go on. What's the matter? You weren't looking for me to give me a... What? What? There comes a sailor, John. With a sea bag, John. What of it? Who can tell what's in the sea bag? Jewels, maybe. Or what can be sold for money. Could you take it from him, John? Give me the watch, you said. You take that sea bag from the sailor, boy, and I'll give it to you. You swear. I do, John. Oh, I do. Now give me the watch. Now first let's see what's in the sea bag. Why, here's a pretty John. A knitted hat. Put it on, John. Do. I'll help you. There. How nice you look, John. And a friendship was born. 
And all over the Caribbean, people ducked when John Richardson and Dick Coyle came into town. However, there were the unwarned, the unwary. For instance, on a night in Port-au-Prince, Alaska off a trader. You can pluck the earring from his ear, John. Get him. Oh, Alaska. Good, John. Uh, Hatch the boy, John. Help yourself. It looked fine in your ear. Or on a night in Roanoke, just when the colonists were finally going good in there with the Indians. Indians has got nothing. Have to hit a dozen of them before it's worth the night. And then, professionals that they were, they were ready for New York. And they made out well. The big city folks hadn't heard about them, so no one was ducking. And just when Big John and Little Dick were raking it in, so to speak, you guessed it, a woman. Put me down. <laughs> Put me down. Put her down, John. <laughs> He's a strong one, John is, ain't he, Bertha? Oh, Yes. John. Aye. Would you like to kiss Miss Nolding? Aye. He'd like to kiss you. Ah, ah, ah. Go on, Johnny. <laughs> He's my friend, Johnny is. He's my friend. Dick. Uh, Dicky. Kiss her again, John. Kiss her. <laughs> now you listen to me, Dicky. <laughs> Dicky! Now, now, don't you do it, John. Don't you do nothing to me. I'll leave him be, John. I just want to tell him... I'm listening at you, John. I like this one, Dickie. Uh... I like to marry this one. I'll be blowed. I like you too, John. Well, ask her. Ask her. Uh, you... Uh, me, uh... uh Miss Nolan, uh... my friend would consider it indeed a great honor if you give him your hand in marrying. Oh, I'd love to. Which are the events immediately surrounding the marriage of Bertha Nolding and John Richardson? They moved into a small cottage and took in one boarder. You know who, Dick Coyle. John was so enamored with Bertha that Dick couldn't get him to go out nights and do their routine on the docks. So soon, their money ran out. Let's go to sea again, John boy. Bertha. Yes, John boy? He wants me to go to sea again. Why? The money's run out. And... Why don't you go to sea again, John boy? And they got a berth on the good ship Malta Queen, shipping tar out of Boston, picking up sugar out of Havana and taking it to Florida. And one night, just before dawn, John was at the wheel, and Coyle was by his side. Have another, John boy. Drink here. Ugh. Yeah. Good rum. Uh, Havana rum is the best. And look what you've done. And what have I done? Let go of the wheel and look at the zigzag you're making. <laughs> <laughs> Come, wheel. Come to me, wheel. Wheel spin. <laughs> I'll have you another, John boy. After you, mate. Oh, no, after you. All righty. <coughs> Havana rum's the best rum. Tell you what it does. Goodens the eye. You know what, no. Goodens the eye, aye? Goodens it. Give you, for instance. Give me one, Johnny boy. Off the bow there. Rocks. The kiss of three sisters rock, they call it. Know it well, for when I sail and with... And you're thinking we'll hit it with the booty now, the way we're sailing. Aye, that I do. That we won't. Sharp eyes in me now that the Havana rum... <laughs> remember that shipwreck, don't you, in which the frigate sank in six minutes? It is interesting to note that the coral rock known as the Kiss of Three Sisters was later changed by seamen to Shark's Feast Rock, and so it remains today. Coyle and Richardson, however, clung to a spar and drifted to shore, the sole survivors of their grisly mistake. 
They were picked up from an atoll in Key West by a pirate band with whom they made fast friends as their personal philosophies were very much akin. In six months, Richardson and Coyle were back in New York, sunburned and broke. They made their way immediately to the little cottage where resides John's wife, Bertha. And what did you bring for me, John? I had your name tattooed to me. Now, what a thing to bring to a wife. Dick here had your name tattooed to him, too. Now, did you, Dick? Aye, right across my chest. Mrs. Bertha Richardson. Your loves, the two of you. Now, I have a surprise for you. What be it? I've got 800 pounds. Oh. Have you now? My daddy dear died of the jumping glanders. Oh, poor man. And 800 pounds he left, did he? He did, indeed. And where's the pounds, me darling Mrs. Richardson? In the loose brick there, keeping it as a surprise for my wandering Johnny boy. Come to me, Johnny boy. Aye. John? Johnny boy, I missed you. Do it, John. A pretty throat, John. Bertha. John. Do it. We'll have that money, John. Bertha. Bertha. That's the lad. Bertha. You've done it, lad. Bertha. Lad. Lad, John boy. Let go, Johnny boy. You've done it. It's here, John. The money's here, just like Bertha said. What a surprise for a homecoming. Good boy. As luck would have it, there was a boat leaving that very night for Italy. The Sorrento Dove, Captain Lucian Faber, master. The boys signed on. Three nights at sea, Dick Coyle got the first mate so drunk that all he had to do was lead him by the hand and... That's how Coyle's friend Richardson got to be first mate. are listening to Crime Classics and your host, Thomas Hyland. This coming Sunday, for the fifth consecutive year, CBS Radio's Edward R. Murrow calls in CBS Radio newsmen from all over the world to take part in person in his Years of Crisis report to the nation. A review of 1953 and forecast for the year to come will come from correspondents who've seen it all happen in Europe and Asia during the past year. You owe it to yourself to hear Years of Crisis, 1953, this coming Sunday. And now, once again, Thomas Highland and the second act of Crime Classics and his report to you on Coyle and Richardson, why they hung in a spanking breeze. Venice, Italy in 1737 is where Richardson and Coyle made their next appearance. They were in a gondola, being pulled down the Grand Canal, enjoying the sights and the company of Carlotta Faber. And was my husband kind to you? A question asked because Captain Lucian Faber was her husband, and Captain Faber was the master of the vessel that had brought the lads to Venice. I was kind to them. Ain't she a pretty one, Mr. Coyle? Ow! The captain asked, jabbing Dick Coyle with his elbow. Watch the elbow, Captain! And my mate stumbled overboard, I made Richardson there take his place. And when I lost my second in the blow off the Azores, well, I promoted Mr. Coyle. Didn't I, Mr... Oh, please, Captain. And a fine mate, I'd say, Mr. Richardson did make. Ah, and you'd be saying true, Mrs. Captain Faber. Look at him there, sleeping like a babe. Big John Richardson. Bambino. Molte bambino. Molte, molte. Carlotta, you promised not to talk Italian when I come home. I've got no way of knowing what you said when... I said simply that Mr. Richardson was a large baby. Large, large. Captain. Uh, yes? How come?
come you come to settle here in Venice, Captain? In Carlotta, her home. She doesn't want to leave. I want to take her to Camden, New Jersey to live. My home. But the dear darling wanted to stay here in Venice. Molte, molte, molte. Huh? What did you say, dear darling? Nothing. Oh, bring yourself here, dear darling, and lean against me. Come. No. Now you just come here. No, no. Now you don't have to be bashful about my if friend. If I will move, I will awaken this great bambino who has fallen asleep in such a way that I... Let's don't wake him, Captain. He'll just clutter up. Let's talk about what we started out to talk about. Yes. John and me always wanted to own a ship, Captain. What are you humming for, Carlotta, dear darling? I want to hum, that is all. Captain. Oh, yes. Go on, mister. What were you saying? Well, John and me always wanted a boat. You ain't saying we got enough to buy a whole boat. Not a whole boat such as yours, but half a boat. How much are you holding, mister? Six hundred pounds. Can't sell you no partnership for so little. Seven, Captain. I'm loading cargo tomorrow for Honduras, mister. Before I get clearing, I'm needing more than seven, mister. Eight, and that's all we got. And uh, that's all I need. We'll draw papers in the morning. Good. Full partners. Full partners. And one of us gets hurt or dead, the share goes to the other. Agreed. John, Johnny boy, wake. <coughs> we own half a boat, Johnny. Ah. Half a boat. How did I get here? Multi, multi. Now, mind you, Johnny boy, keep it on course. Aye. Hold the wheel as tight as if it were your own lady. Aye. This ain't the Malta Queen to be run up on the rocks, John. This is our own ship. Half. Johnny boy, that's thinking you're doing when you say it's a shame only half the ship belongs to us. And such a shame, too. Aye. Aye, you say, and why do you say that? What could be in that thinking brain of yours? Huh? You said twas a shame only half a ship was... You said it, so it must be a shame. Shall I tell you why, John boy? Aye. Because half a ship is half a cargo and half a profit. Aye. And the whole ship... Well, now listen, John boy. We contracted with a captain. One partner dies, his share goes to the other. Aye. He's in his cabin, John boy. In his hammock. Peaceful. And... Let's have him an accident, John boy. Aye. Now. Aye. Aye, Preebles. Avast, Preebles. Take the wheel for Mr. Richardson, mister. The captain's calling to us. Oh, it's a good day for us, John boy. You know who is a nice lady? Uh-huh. The captain's wife. She's a widow you can marry with. Aye. Here. Oh, Mr. Hartley. Now, what can I do for you, mister? A steward, you be holding the blunderbuss under lock and key. Aye. And so? Well, let's have it, lad. Let's have it. Only the captain asks for the blunderbuss and gets it, mister. The first mate here wants it. I want it. Only the captain wants it and gets it. John, boy. Aye. Such a big gun, this blunderbuss. Come along, John. Shh. It's a beautiful way to die, Johnny boy. Sleeping in a hammock with softy dreams. Put the muzzle to him, John, and send him on. Well, do it. Dickie. Do it. I can't. Chicken heart of a man, pull the trigger. Shoot his head uh, off. Uh, uh, the trigger's stuck. What, what is happening here? Strangle him, John boy. Throw the gun aside and strangle him. I... No, you don't. No. Catch him, John. Shoot him, strangle him. Run, put the gun aside, strangle him. Which, what do you want me to do? Catch him, catch him and kill him. Yeah. 
He's climbing the rigging, Dickie. Well, let him climb. We'll shoot him down from there like a nesting bird. Hey there, Captain. You know what's going to happen to you, don't you? Mean man, you'll sail to the death of all of us. Get the trigger fixed, John boy. Aye. Aye, aye. <laughs> Let me try to construct the picture for you. A picture first, a frigate under full sail on the Honduras run. Sea, sky, ship. Now, rigging of ship. Now, on rigging, captain of ship. Fresh from a noonday snooze and hammock, who, from force of habit, had time only to grab his plumed captain's hat. Scared. Below him on deck, Dickie Coyle and John Richardson. Dickie threatening the captain's life, and John fingering the trigger of a blunderbuss, which had a pretty good range. And now, gathering toward the scene of this nautical picture... The crew, muttering, pointing, and wide-eyed. Now the picture moves, as the captain holds on with one hand and gesticulates with the other. Men, listen to me. I am your captain, and you who have sailed with me before know, oh, how well you know, that I have only your welfare at heart. Which of you has it in him to stand by and watch his captain perish? Which of you does not remember the storms I've sailed you through? The still seas and the torrents. And which of you could not come to me in times of stress, needing advices or medicines? And I would give it to you. Men, I order you. Seize those two men who wish to murder me and throw me into irons. I order it. And there will be rum in the forecastle when I get back on deck. You have heard me, men. Now act. The men used to a ship where fair play had been practiced only shifted their feet and listened just as attentively to what Dickie Coyle had to say. And Dickie Coyle said it. Get below, men. I'll divide with all of you what monies there are in the captain's chest. Get below. How's the trigger, John boy? Fixed. Throw him overboard, John. Now turn the boat around, John boy, and let's go back to Venice. it is you. Finally, it is the two of you. After a year, it's been. Hello, ma'am. Molte. I cannot allow myself to say it. Oh, yes, you can. Your husband's dead, ma'am. You tell me this? Foot caught in a halyard, ma'am, and over I went. In a storm he was. Men begging him to stay below. They loved him so. But not him, brave fool that he was. Police! Ma'am, what are you saying? There came here a steward to my husband from whom you wrested the blunderbuss he would not give you. He has told me the story. How you shot! John boy, we'd better run. We'd best leave here, John boy. I'd like to read a translation from a Venetian chronicle of the time. Richardson and Coyle were apprehended by the local police on the Ponte Vecchio, where they were splitting a goatskin of wine. When taken in custody, they were dressed as gondoliers. In prison, Richard Coyle convinced his jailer that a terrible mistake had been made, that he and his friend were indeed servants to the King of Naples. They were released. Don't feel too badly, good man. Mistakes will happen. Come along, John. The King must be worried. Come, come. Only to be apprehended again when they paused over another skin of wine. And they were tried and found guilty of murder and mutiny. And one day... They were led in chains to a ship of the Navy which was about to sail. The order of execution had it that Richard Coyle was to die first, but there was a conference. You want to go first, don't you, John boy? Well, I... Sure you do. I want to go first! So the order was reversed, and as the ship sailed to sea, they were hanged from a yard arm, and past the breakwater, they were cut down. John Richardson hit the water first.
In just a moment, Thomas Highland will tell you about next week's crime classic. Coyle and Richardson, tonight's crime classic, was adapted from the original court reports and newspaper accounts by Morton Fine and David Friedkin. The music was composed by Bernard Herman and conducted by Lud Gluskin. And the program is produced and directed by Elliot Lewis. Thomas Highland is portrayed on radio by Lou Merrill. In tonight's story, Walter Tetley was heard as Coyle and Clayton Post as Richardson. Featured in the cast were Georgia Ellis, Herb Butterfield, Gladys Holland, and Charles Calvert. Gil Warren speaking. And here again is Thomas Highland. Next week, the border country just after the Civil War. And a report on some soldiers who continued killing after it was legally prohibited. It's listed in my files as the Younger Brothers. Why, some of them grew no older. Thank you. Good night. Don't forget, the old redhead Red Barber will be masterminding CBS Radio's exclusive broadcast of the Maryland-Oklahoma Grid Fracas down in Miami's Orange Bowl this New Year's Day. Your radio's your ticket and your midfield seat as well for the big one of January 1, the Orange Bowl Classic. Miami to you via most of these same stations. Thursday night, Marlena Dietrich stars in Time for Love on the CBS Radio Network. Thanks for listening. If you like what you heard, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves old-time radio or the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me and follow me on social media through the Weird Darkness website. WeirdDarkness.com is also where you can listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, get the email newsletter, visit the store for creepy and cool Weird Darkness merchandise you can find other podcasts that I host. Plus, it's where you can find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression, addiction, or thoughts of harming yourself or others. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me for this episode of Weird Darkness's Retro Radio. Retro Radio